From Kern Government Television, welcome to this week's Kern County Board of Supervisors meeting, originating from the County Administrative Center located at 1115 Truxton Avenue, Bakersfield, California. Kern County's vision is to create and maintain a customer-centered county government designed to garner the confidence, support, and trust of the people we serve. Today's Kern County Board of Supervisors meeting will convene momentarily. Okay, board to reconvene. Uh, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Supervisor Peters. Here. Supervisor Scribner. Here. Supervisor Maggard. Here. Supervisor Couch. Here. Supervisor Perez. Good morning and welcome to the Tuesday, April 27th, 9 a.m. meeting of the Kern County Board of Supervisors. In lieu of reciting the Pledge of Allegiance this morning, we are honored to have the Kern County Sheriff's Color Guard present colors and Deputy Sheriff Ashley Benitez will sing the national anthem. After the colors are retired, please stay standing for a moment of prayer, silence, or meditation, whichever you prefer. Oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight Oh, the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare, the bones bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star-spangled banner yet wave Oh, the land of the free and the home of the brave. Next, I would like to call on Nick Cullen, Director of the Animal Services Department, to introduce our Pet of the Week. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? <laughs> uh, good morning, um, Chairman and Chairman and members of the board. I have with me this morning uh, Connor. Um, Connor's about a five-year-old blocky-headed type dog, what you might all recognize as a pit bull, which um, we try to rebrand. Um, it's not really a breed name, and it gives him a bad name, but he's just a sweet old blocky-headed type dog. Um, like I said, he's about five years old. He's already neutered. He's ready to go home. He's been with, the, um, been with us for uh, quite a while, it's about two months um, since February, and uh, we're seeking either a permanent adoption or temporary foster. The reason why it's been difficult to find him home is because we recommend him to be an only dog home. He doesn't get along with other dogs. Um, nothing vicious or, or terrible, but uh, he's very dominant. 
Um, so we recommend an only dog home, but he's looking for a home, and he's been with us since February, and he's just the sweetest dog in the whole wide world. Well, thank you very much for bringing him down. Uh, hopefully somebody uh, can uh, give him a new home today. I appreciate it, Nate. Thank you. The County of Kern has provided notice that as a result of the declared federal, state, and local emergencies due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and in light of the governor's orders, this Board of Supervisors meeting is not physically open to the public. Testimony and general public comment are accepted via email or voice message to the clerk of the board's office prior to today's meeting, and live comments via teleconference will be heard during the meeting. We will begin by considering the consent agenda. All items listed with a CA above the items are considered to be routine and non-controversial by county staff. Consent items will be considered first and may be approved by one motion. If a member of the public wishes to comment or ask questions regarding an item on the consent agenda, they may do so prior to a vote being taken. A member of the board may remove any item from the consent agenda, and it will be considered in listed sequence with an opportunity for any member of the public to address the board concerning the item before action is taken. A member of the public may also comment on any closed session item. At this time, I will read the consent agenda item numbers, and that is items one through four and seven through 10 on page two, Items 13 through 16 on page 3, 17 through 21 on page 4, 25 through 33 on page 5, 34 through 38, and 40 through 42 on page 6, 43 through 49 on page 7, item 50, as well as items 52 through 56 on page 8, 57 through 64 on page 9, 65 through 73 on page 10, and items 74 and 75 on page 11. I would also like to note that item number 58 has been withdrawn by staff and will not be heard today. Uh, Madam Clerk, are there any members of the public wishing to uh, speak to the consent agenda? No, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, would any members of the board like an item removed for discussion? Supervisor Scrivener. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Isaac Scrivener will abstain from the following consent calendar items. Um, item number 54 and item number 62 due to a source of income to my spouse. Um, I will, um, clerk, I will um, vote on the remaining items, and please record my abstention on items 54 and 62. Thank you. Great. Motion, motion on consent. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Please cast your votes. Supervisor Perez, do you want to, can we cast your vote? Oh, thank you. Thank you. The motion is approved. All ayes. Thank you. And we'll now consider our first item off consent, item number five, proclaiming May 2021 as Mental Health Awareness Month in Kern County. Now, we're not yet making ceremonial presentations at the podium, but I would like to invite up uh, Stacy Kuahara, the Director of Kern County Behavioral Health and Recovery Services, uh, to be heard on this item. Good morning, Chairman Peters, members of the board, CAO Alsop. Thank you for having us this morning to discuss May and Mental Health Awareness Month. The struggles and uncertainty of the last year have shown us how important it is to have conversations about mental health. The month of May is the start of Mental Health Awareness Month and Kern Behavioral Health and Recovery Services is celebrating our 22nd year with events and activities. In the United States, approximately one in five individuals are living with mental health conditions. With the COVID pandemic across the country, we're seeing increasing levels of anxiety and depression. We're seeing alarming numbers of children reporting thoughts of suicide and self-harm. Mental Health Awareness Month is an opportunity for our community to come together, spread awareness about mental health issues, and end the stigma. It's critical to let our community know it's okay to talk about our feelings, the challenges we're having, and to reach out for help. We're excited this year to kick off the month by lighting the county administrative building in lime green, our signature mental health color. Please watch for the live event on our Kern BHRS Facebook page at 745 on May 3rd. May 7th through the 9th, we'll be providing an art in the park pop-up art installation with 15 murals promoting mental health wellness along the Panorama Park at the Bluffs. 
On May 14th, we'll be hosting a virtual mental health symposium for youth with Assemblyman Vince Fong and the Kern County Superintendent of Schools, the Kern High School District, and Kaiser Permanente. We'll be hosting a goodie bag distribution with free food boxes to the community in partnership with CityServe and Dignity Health on May 20th. And we're really excited to be launching a mental health mural campaign called the Evergreen Project. We'll be commissioning four or five permanent murals created for the public starting in May and going through September to promote mental health awareness. We invite you through the month of May to help bring awareness to mental health by participating in any of the activities I've mentioned and to wear green every Tuesday, helping break the stigma associated with seeking help for mental health. I've shared with you our lime green ribbons. You can wear them throughout the month and support our cause. Thank you for celebrating with us, for all of those who have sought help and found a path toward recovery. This concludes my presentation. Thank you, Ms. Kaur. Uh, Madam Clerk, have we received any public comment on this? No, sir, we have not. Thank you. Uh, with that, I would entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Please cast your votes. Excuse me, the motion is approved, all ayes. Okay, our next item off consent is item number six, proclaiming May 10th through May 14th as Peace Officer Memorial Week in Kern County. And with that, I would like to invite Kern County Sheriff uh, Donnie Youngblood to be heard on this item. I kind of came up without the invitation, uh, Chairman. I apologize for that. That's all right. You don't need it. <laughs> for the record, I was coming anyway. <laughs> uh, good morning, Chairman and members of the board. Uh, thank you for the proclamation this week. It's especially uh, uh, meaningful to uh, law enforcement as uh, across this country, 264 law enforcement officers last year lost their lives in the line of duty. Some of those were COVID related and um, ironically, many of those were people of color, uh, not color blue or tan, but African-Americans, Hispanics, Caucasian, Asian, uh, it didn't, uh, uh, being any one race didn't help or hurt. It just is is what it is. Uh, COVID has been a, really a, a impacted us a great deal. Last week, I was uh, at the, one of the local medias for a morning show, and they asked me when my employees would all be going back to work. And I was shocked at that when I, and I said, uh, we've been at work. We haven't missed a, a day of work. Uh, deputies uh, go to work every single day, go to, to places where COVID may or may not exist. Detention deputies go to work every single day uh, knowing that COVID is in the jail. A wing of, of COVID positive people, somebody has to work that and uh, they showed up every single day. Our coroners, investigators have gone out on COVID related deaths every single day. Uh, dispatchers have come to work. Our professional staff have all come to work. And, but we have not gone unscathed during this past year as we lost an employee uh, to COVID. And we had several employees who uh, were uh, cont contracted COVID and have since recovered, uh, some more than once. It's something that uh, uh, we accept and we do. Uh, it, it, this week is especially meaningful to us because of what's going on in our country. We appreciate it a great deal. And the last thing I would say is in spite of what you might hear in the news media, because I don't give a damn, we are the good guys. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff Youngblood. Uh, Madam Clerk, have we received any public comment on this item? No, sir, we have not. Okay, I would entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Second. Please cast your votes. The motion is approved, all ayes. Great. Okay, the board will now consider item number 11, public presentations. This portion of the meeting is reserved for persons to address the board on any matter not on this agenda, but under the jurisdiction of the board. Board members may respond briefly to statements made or questions posed. They may ask a question for clarification, make a referral to staff for factual information, or request staff to report back to the board at a later meeting. Also, the board may take action to direct the staff to place a matter of business on a future agenda. Speakers are limited to two minutes. Please state and spell your name before making your presentation. Madam Clerk, are there any members of the public wishing to address the board? Mr. Chairman, uh, we do have Rudy Gonzalez who uh, signed up to address your board under public comment. 
Mr. Gonzalez, if you would unmute your phone by pressing star six, you have two minutes to address the board. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, I just got word that Mr. Gonzalez hung up, so I'm not sure what the issue is. I do want to let your board know that we did receive an email. You have a copy of that email uh, regarding homeless shelter concerns. Um, this is from Christine Picard, and um, I just wanted to let you know that that will be received and filed under public presentations, and I will be checking teams to see if Mr. Gonzalez uh, calls back. Great, thank you. If, if he does, maybe we can hear him after our next item. Okay. Okay, next we'll consider item number 12, board member announcements or reports. And I would like to begin by asking Bryn Kerrigan, the Director of Kern County Public Health Services, to provide an update on the COVID-19 pandemic. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Two weeks ago, Kern County moved into the orange tier or tier three of the blueprint for a safer economy. Starting last week, two of our three metrics have met the threshold for the yellow tier or the least restrictive tier. Our case rate continues to meet orange tier metrics. However, we did see a decrease from last week. Specifically, our adjusted case rate this week is 3.4 per 100,000 people. Last week, it was 3.7 per 100,000 people. This week, our countywide testing positivity rate is 1.4%. Last week, it was 1.5%. And this week, our health equity positivity rate is 1.5%, while last week, it was 2%. While it is important to note that only eight counties in California have a case rate under three per 100,000, so while we still meet the orange tier metrics, we are actually doing really well with our disease prevalence. The earliest Kern could be eligible for the yellow tier is May 12th. As of today, the county has been allocated 409,725 doses of the COVID-19 vaccine. 443,336 doses have been administered to Kern County residents. 184,330 people have completed their vaccination series, which is about 28% of our 16 and older population and another 85,279 people have received one dose of their two dose series, meaning 41% of our 16 and older population have either partially or fully been vaccinated. 60,055 people 65 and older have completed their vaccination series, meaning 55.7% of our 65 and older population has been fully vaccinated. There has been a decrease in the number of doses administered to Kern County residents over the past two weeks. The week of April 5th, 49,885 doses were administered to Kern County residents. The week of the Johnson & Johnson pause, which was the week of April 12th, 35,780 doses were administered to Kern County residents. This last week, the week of April 19th, there were 27,398 doses administered to Kern County residents. Additionally, our vaccine allotment continues to fluctuate. Kern County will receive 18,730 doses of vaccine this week. Last week, Kern County received 16,560 doses. If we continue to receive vaccine at the rate we receive doses this week, it will take us 35 weeks to get the rest of our 16 and older population fully vaccinated. As your board is aware, on April 13th, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration recommended a pause on the administration of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine due to reports of six cases of a rare and severe type blood clot following the administration of the J&J COVID-19 vaccine. On Friday, the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, or ACIP, met for a second time since the pause to review the data regarding the blood clots with low platelet counts that appears to be associated with the J&J &J vaccination. The ACIP voted at the conclusion of the meeting to resume the use of the J&J &J vaccine for all ages permitted under the emergency use authorization, which is 18 and older. 
Following ACIP's vote, the Western States Scientific Safety Work Group also met to review the information. A statement was issued on Saturday that stated that California vaccinating providers could resume the administration of the J&J vaccine as long as they provide appropriate education materials to inform patients of the vaccine's health effects and available vaccination options. Yesterday morning, all Kern County vaccination providers were told they could resume the use of the J&J shot. While blood clots with low platelet counts is very, very rare, it is important to know that for people who may be concerned about the J&J vaccine, there are still other vaccine products available as vaccine is still the safest way to build immunity against COVID. According to the CDC, as of April 20th, more than 87 million people residing within the United States have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19. Of those 87 million fully vaccinated people, only 7,157 cases of vaccine breakthrough infections have been reported, meaning 0.008% of fully vaccinated people have been reported as infected with COVID after being fully vaccinated. This tells us that the vaccines are preventing infections. Vaccination is not only the best way to dramatically reduce the risks of getting infected with, hospitalized, or frankly dying due to COVID-19, but is also a method used to prevent diseases from taking hold in our community. It is important to know that when you get vaccinated, we are not only protecting ourselves from COVID-19, but our loved ones, our community members, and those who are not eligible or able to get vaccinated. In addition to our traditional awareness campaign strategies using television, radio, and social media, we have used many non-traditional methods to promote vaccination. We've launched three contracted mobile vaccination sites to bring vaccination opportunities throughout Kern County. We've partnered with the Kern County Latino Task Force and other trusted messengers to help with awareness. We perform door-to-door -door canvassing, providing face-to-face -face contact with members of our community, offering education and answering questions. We've utilized our reverse 911 messaging through our ReadyKern system. We have launched billboard campaigns. We've launched vaccine information booths staffed with nurses in areas where our most vulnerable populations frequent to help answer uh, vaccine questions, dispel vaccination myths, and help residents get signed up in my turn for a vaccination appointment. And we've recently launched a public health nurse vaccination hotline with a dedicated number that our residents can call or text to get their vaccine related questions answered directly by a nurse seven days per week from 7 a.m. to 7, 7 p.m. In addition, we have multiple efforts in the works. We've contracted with GetBus to wrap 71 GetBuses in vaccine related educational materials and for educational materials to be placed inside every single get bus. We're developing an educational campaign for parks throughout Kern County. This campaign will include banners, yard signs, and posters placed throughout parks. We're launching an educational campaign in county and many incorporated city building lobbies. We are going to do mass mailings of two infographics, one that compares the three COVID vaccines and the other is a myths versus facts comparison. Additionally, we'll be mailing postcards with invitations to the Kern County Fairgrounds Clinic in, ba in the Bakersfield area and to go to my turn to find a provider in the area for those in the outlying areas. We're designing large magnets for county cars to promote vaccination and we're developing an educational campaign for the area surrounding the fairgrounds to try to encourage people driving in the area to stop in and get vaccinated. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, this completes my update. Thank you, Ms. Kerrigan. Uh, Supervisor Maggard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate you letting me uh, speak with Ms. Kerrigan for a moment. Thank you, Ms. Kerrigan, for your report. And uh, we, we are still making progress. I'm delighted at that. Uh, I wanted to talk to you for just a second about uh, the rate of vaccinations and uh, what your suggestions are as we go forward. Um, let's talk first about the consequence of not being vaccinated. So is it, uh, I've read recently and talked with a physician friend of mine who uh, reiterated to me that from this point forward, virtually every death from COVID-19 was preventable had that person taken the vaccine. Can you uh, talk about that for a moment? 
Absolutely, Supervisor Magger, that is 100% accurate. Um, at this point, we are looking at deaths and severe illnesses as preventable because of the vaccine. Because isn't it true that not only does the vaccine uh, prevent in almost every case of death, but it also significantly reduces the onset of the, the symptoms as they come upon the person who's fallen ill to the disease. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I hear that there is a um, kind of a, 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 I wouldn't say it's a movement because I don't think it's that large, but there are some in our uh, culture, in our country, who are making the argument that if my child, now it isn't approved for children under the age of 16 yet, right? Uh, but but if, should, should we get our, our kids or should we be vaccinated against a disease that um, is only gonna kill, you know, a very, very small percentage of the people who contract it now. And uh, what I also have discovered in talking with my physician friend and the reading I've done is that it's much like the measles or mumps or polio. There's a reason that we, even people that will never catch the disease, we want them, it's unlikely that they'll catch the disease or die from it. We want them to take the, the vaccination because it helps us uh, stop the, vac the, the, uh, the disease from mutating. And as it mutates, it becomes more deadly to those who do catch it. Can you deal, uh, uh, deal with that issue for us for a moment? Absolutely, Supervisor Maggard, through the chair, you're absolutely correct. We use vaccines to stop diseases from entering into our community um, often. It is a very, um, um, it is a very good tool for us to use to stop diseases from coming in, and if they're here, to stop them from spreading and from mutating, like you said. Um, you brought up measles. That's a very good point. Um, measles is not around right now. We don't see measles very often in the United States. We do sometimes see it in travelers, but because our community gets vaccinated for measles, when somebody does travel through with measles, we do not see anybody get measles here in, in Bakersfield, in Kern County, or anywhere else in the U.S. These are, are very good tools to use to stop the spread of the disease. Well, thank you for that explanation. And I, I recognize that children under the age of 16 are not yet uh, approved for receiving the vaccine, but uh, research is going on to try to make sure that uh, if, if there is a safe way, and I'm confident there will be a safe way for them to receive vaccines, that will occur at a later date. Yes, yeah. um, right now it's under clinical trials for those that are ages 12 to 15 for the Pfizer vaccine. Okay, thank you. So then with regard to those um, deaths that would have been preventable, there are still some people who are going to contract the disease and show up at our hospitals. And uh, what do you think is the likelihood, is the chance that there may be another spike looming out there? So the chances are great that there could potentially be another spike. Right now we're seeing a lot of people that contracted COVID in this most recent surge that likely still have some natural immunity from COVID right now. And we're seeing about um, a third of our population that's been fully vaccinated. So that's why we're seeing transmission very low now. But as that natural immunity wears off from the previous COVID infection, we will likely see um, a big increase in cases if we don't get vaccinated. We're also starting to see some variants um, pop up. We have eight of the B117, and then we have a new variant, the South African variant, that um, we had a case, a positive case of last week. So in the event that there were to be another um, spike, how confident are you that we have now built the infrastructure and have the capacity so that we won't run out of ICU capacity and hospital capacity to treat not only COVID patients, but all, everyone else? So your board has done a fantastic job of, of allowing us to have the infrastructure in place to handle another surge for COVID-19. Um, in the last surge, we had ICU nurses placed at all of our local hospitals that helped to deal with that surge. At one point, we had 400 and, or 444 patients in the hospital due to COVID-19. That is a tremendous burden on our hospital system. We have maintained those nurses within our hospitals so that if we do start to see a surge again, our hospitals are prepared. And we also have all, our alternative care site, which is our field hospital that's ready to be deployed within 72 hours. So maintaining that um, to see if another surge happens is going to be very helpful for us if we do start to see cases rise. So th thank you for your leading into my last question for this morning, and that is uh, how important is it that we sustain our effort, not only uh, going into uh, areas and making people aware of uh, the disease and testing and vaccines and whatnot, but also the alternative care site, also the vaccination site. Uh, 
what, what, what are your thoughts on whether or not we should sustain that as we go forward? Even uh, though that is, it may be that the disease is waning, how important is it to sustain those efforts? So sustaining those efforts is essential to keeping our infrastructure ready to address a, a third surge here in our community while we work on educating our community about the importance of getting vaccinated and answer any vaccine related questions that they have. Well, thank you. I, I wanna thank uh, my colleagues on the board for their unwavering, full-fledged, you know, they jumped into this and have done and spent, uh, done whatever was necessary, spent all the money that was necessary for us to be in the position that we're in. And I just wanna tell my colleagues how much I'm grateful for the, to them and for our other staff, uh, you and Mr. Constantine before you and Mr. Alsop and others for your help in that regard. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. That's all I have about uh, COVID, thank you. Th thank you, Supervisor Maggard. Supervisor Scrivener. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Kerrigan, I, um, I appreciated the line of questioning from Supervisor Maggard at the end there, particularly in regard to our, our infrastructure. Um, there was an article I read in regard to the site at CSUB and they're, they're looking, um, I guess it's because of a decline in the number of vaccines that are being administered there. They're looking at going more to pop-up sites. Um, and I think the quote, quote from the Kaiser um, CEO was somewhere along the lines of, of we're gonna take the vaccine to the people. And so that, that's what I wanted to ask about. We have our ACA where we're administering um, at the fairgrounds vaccines, but you, you believe that we should still keep that operation in place because it, it's part of the overall infrastructure in case we do see a surge where we may, we may you know, God forbid, have to, have to uh, activate the ACA. Is, can you elaborate a little bit more on that rather than using those resources to, to push out into the community, keeping that site? Because it, it, it does beg the question when we see 4,700 vaccines administered last week when the site's designed to do a lot more than that. Um, but that, does that decline mean that we should be doing more, more um, out in the field, so to speak? Or do you think that the outreach efforts are, are going to be effective and so we should keep the site in place? Supervisor Scrivener through the chair. Um, I absolutely think we need to keep that known, trusted site in place. Um, it's only been two weeks since we've seen a decline in our vaccination rates. Three weeks ago, we saw our, our all-time high across Kern County um, of vaccination rates. Then we saw the J&J &J pause and we saw that number decline. I think we need to continue to provide the education um, to our community and we'll start to see those numbers pick up and we need to have that site that our community knows about that they can go to and get vaccinated. What we've also been doing is we've been doing mobile vaccination efforts as well. And so we've been part partnering with trusted messengers in the community, having um, targeted sort of sites that we've been using for that mobile vaccination um, opportunity. And we're gonna continue those efforts as well. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Any, any uh, other questions or comments for Ms. Kerrigan? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. A couple of things I wanted to bring up. Uh, recently, I signed off on a letter as uh, board chair, along with the uh, chairs of seven other boards of supervisors from around the Central Valley, asking Governor Newsom to declare a state of emergency due to the ongoing drought here. And that's already been done at the federal level through uh, our Ag Secretary, Tom Vilsack. And if we could get that accomplished at the state level, I think it would bring some uh, relief to our ag uh, industry here and would also present us with a few different options as far as uh, contending with the drought here at the local level. So that being said, I would like to ask our CAO's office if they could um, draft a, a local emergency declaration in regards to that drought and bring that back to the board at our May 11th meeting so the board can, can consider that and potentially move forward on it. If that is, Mr. Chairman, if that is your direction uh, in the direction of the board, I will bring that back May 11th. Okay, thank you. And do, uh, do, you, do we need a motion on that? We good, okay, thanks. And lastly, I wanted to um, ask our CAO, you know, as we're getting closer to the end of the tiered system for uh, COVID here in California, if you could give us just a quick update on what our reopening plan for the county looks like, you know, particularly for the board chambers. Here. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, uh, in consultation with the, uh, the clerk of the board, our county council, and uh, Ms. Kerrigan of Public Health, we are uh, uh, preparing a transition back to um, a more normal operations uh, here in the board chambers. Uh, we are currently planning for uh, opening up 
maintaining, while maintaining all of our current protocols that we have in place, uh, opening up the board chambers in limited capacity uh, for your board meetings in May, uh, which will start May 11th. And uh, we have 65 available seats, as you see in the, in the audience, uh, with, with spacing. Uh, we are, uh, are planning to open those seats up at a 65 person max, obviously with uh, other uh, protocols in place, uh, uh, obviously distancing uh, and mask wearing uh, while they're here. And uh, we will be planning for a wider uh, reopening for the public in June in coordination with uh, what we expect will be uh, some additional state directives on reopening. Uh, in the middle of June. Uh, obviously, it will dep also depend on where we are with overall with, um, with the pandemic and our numbers here locally. Uh, so that's right now, Mr. Chairman, our plan. Uh, so a wider opening, uh, limited capacity starting uh, May 11th. And we will work with the clerk of the board to make sure the public is aware of that. Great. Thank you, Mr. Alsop. Are there any other uh, comments, uh, Supervisor Maggard? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had two other things I just wanted to mention this morning that uh, uh, at this opportunity, so thank you very much for that. First of all, I'd like to uh, just make note uh, because of how much respect and uh, admiration I have for him and our community has for him, but we lost a native son of Oildale last week, Gerald Haslam, uh, a world-renowned author and um, a very, very highly respected person, a great representative for our community, passed away last week. So when we close our meeting this morning, I hope we would uh, remember uh, Gerald Haslam and his, the tremendous um, um, reputation that he brought uh, to our community, the good reputation and, and uh, accolades to our community from his writings and his life. So thank you for that. Uh, second thing I'd like to talk about is an opportunity that's gonna be taking place in Kern County uh, that I'm delighted to hear about, I'm very excited about. A few years ago, I had the profound experience and blessing of standing at and, go and going through the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem. It is a life-changing uh, experience to go through that and see um, the remembrances and uh, the, just the, it makes you mindful of the consequence of uh, what happened during the Holocaust. And uh, particularly at the end of it, as you are leaving, there is a, uh, a display of the shoes of Holocaust victims that just, uh, it, it will move you like you've not been moved before to see these shoes of real people who were lost in the, uh, in the Holocaust. Well, there is an effort underway to bring a Holocaust memorial to Kern County. And uh, it is at the Shabbat Jewish Community Center on Ming Avenue. It, it, some of you uh, may have noticed that there is, uh, when Laurel Glen Tennis Club ceased operations, it became something else. What it became is the Shabbat Jewish Community Center here in, in Kern County, and it happens to be located in the third district. Well, uh, there is an effort underway led by Rabbi Schlanger uh, to uh, do a, a button memorial. For over a decade, buttons from Holocaust uh, victims have been, and survivors have been gathered, and the goal is to have six million buttons, a button for every Holocaust victim uh, to be, uh, put into a memorial there and a, and a museum be developed along with it at the Shabbat Jewish Community Center here in Kern County. So I'm delighted to hear about that, I'm delighted that it's in the third district and delighted to participate. I, I will be making a donation on behalf of the people of uh, the third district and I hope my colleagues will do the same. Uh, the goal is to reach $300,000 uh, and to be able to put the six million button a memorial in place. It's buttons of every size, texture, color, and shape that you can imagine uh, has been and is and uh, are still being gathered. And uh, I think it will be a great reminder for uh, what should never happen again as we uh, develop a Holocaust memorial here in Kern County. If you're interested in helping, you can contact uh, Rabbi Schlinger at 661-834-1512. 661-834-1512, or contact my office at the 3rd District here in, at the Board of Supervisors, and I'll help connect you to that. So thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and I'm, uh, I appreciate your indulgence to allow me to make those announcements. Thank you, Supervisor Maggard. Supervisor Perez. <clears throat> thank you, Chairman. 
I want to uh, thank my Sheriff Donnie Youngblood and Assemblyman Rudy Salas, and of course, uh, Christian and Kelsey from our staffs for helping to arrange and bring together members of my neighborhood who are very concerned with their safety and the safety of their families. And we've um, had some, some particular incidents occur in our neighborhood that really uh, rattled my neighbors. And they have uh, come to me and have asked if me and our, my other neighbor, Donnie Youngblood, uh, could come to their home and talk to them about uh, public safety and, and about coming together as a community in a way that we haven't before. And I was really nervous about uh, going, uh, frankly, it was the day after a very big verdict in this country that you know, has the potential to uh, tear us apart. Uh, at our at our basic fabric, our, our at the most important level here at the local uh, the local community, and I was just so pleased. I was so moved. My heart is so full uh, from the opportunity to come together with my neighbors, and it was incredibly uh, diverse. I was shocked uh, by the uh, both cultural diversity and the sort of just real diversity that exists in my neighborhood. And I was amazed we didn't uh, talk too much about uh, partisan politics or the federal government. It was really all about our local community. And we were so happy to look each other in the faces. And and our my kids played there. We had a, a big pot belly pig I was stunned by and some huge tortoises in his beautiful yard. And uh, we just had such an incredible connection as neighbors and as human beings. And Donnie, of course, was uh, just so fantastic and so accessible. And uh, it really was one of the finer moments uh, in my career in politics. And we have big plans of what we're going to do to build community, uh, to actual community, right, and, and work and fight like hell to uh, take back our neighborhoods from elements that we know are um, not welcome and not good for the community. Uh, and we can do that in a very positive way that uh, really brings us together and uh, connects us in a way we haven't been before. So I am so grateful. Hats off to you, Donnie, uh, and also to Assemblyman Salas and um, Christian and Kelsey, who uh, you are know, just so incredible uh, in the process of bringing people together. It, it was very humbling and very hopeful. So thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Perez. Are there any other comments or referrals? Okay. Uh, I think we have our speaker from public presentations back in the queue. If we could jump back uh, over to him, Madam Clerk. Yes, Mr. Chairman, we do have uh, Rudy Salas is waiting on the line to address your board under public presentation. So we're going to go back to item 11, public presentations. Mr. Gonzalez, if you would unmute your phone by pressing star six, you have two minutes to address the board. Mr. Rudy Gonzalez, I see that you are in the queue, uh, but you need to unmute your phone. You need to press star six, and then you will be available to address the board. Mr. Gonzalez, I'll give you one more opportunity to unmute your phone by pressing star six in order to address the board. Mr. Chairman, um, I will contact Mr. Gonzalez after the meeting and I will um, provide you with his comments. Great, okay, great, thank, thank you. you very much. Okay, we'll now consider items number 22 and 23 concurrently under behavioral health services. And that is a presentation on initiatives established to combat homelessness in Kern County as well as a proposed agreement with Flood Bakersfield Ministries, Inc. to provide outreach, engagement, housing case management, and linkage to behavioral health services for the population in Kern County. And I would like to begin by calling on our uh, Behavioral Health Director, Stacy Kohara. Good morning. Good morning, Chairman uh, Peters and members of the board. Thank you for the opportunity this morning to present an update on the initiatives Behavioral Health and Recovery Services is taking to address our county's homeless problem. BHRS has a long history of working with individuals with mental illness and substance use disorders who are homeless in our community. 
We have a number of existing activities and programs targeting homeless individuals. The homeless adult team provides outreach, case management, therapy, medication services to individuals who are homeless or at risk of homelessness with serious mental illness. The team provides services at the city and the county navigation centers and works closely with other shelters. They're active in local outreach efforts, though some activities have been limited in the last year because of COVID. The mobile evaluation team or the MET team works with law enforcement responding to mental health crises in our community. Among other duties, this team collaborates with code enforcement and local agencies, responding to homeless encampments and working with homeless individuals who need emergency interventions, often on the street. BHRS has an established contract with Flood Ministries for homeless outreach in our community. I'll be going into flood services later in our presentation with more information as we do plan to make some changes in their programming. But flood engages homeless individuals on the street, screens them for behavioral health conditions and links them to housing, treatment and resources. No Place Like Home is a state initiative allowing behavioral health departments to compete and be awarded mental health funding to develop permanent supportive housing. BHRS partners with the Housing Authority to develop and construct permanent housing units. To date, $6.25 million has been awarded and we're using this money for construction of approximately 100 units. 50% of those units will be available to no place like home eligible tenants living with serious mental illness who are homeless or at risk of homelessness. Solutions to our homeless problem is a countywide effort and success is dependent on our collaborative partnerships. The department participates and supports the work of the Kern Regional Homeless Collaborative. We work closely with our community partners, such as the Housing Authority, Clinica Sierra Vista, with their street medicine program, CAPK, Mercy House, and many others. For today, I'd like to focus on our new initiatives and the steps we're taking to address homelessness. The Kern Relational Outreach and Engagement Model, Rome pilot, the modifications we're making to our existing homeless outreach through flood ministries, and the expansion of involuntary treatment options and evaluations in our community. Not all homeless people are mentally ill, but many are, and even more are abusing substances. Our new initiatives are focused specifically on targeting outreach efforts to make sure we're having a direct successful outcome and to continue to make significant strides in targeted areas. Kern Rome is a pilot program that we started in February of this year. The team focuses on the most mentally ill individuals that need very intensive engagement and specialized behavioral health services. The relational outreach and engagement model is a new way of working in behavioral health outreach for our community. It's defined by shared decision-making, building trust and relationships, and relentlessly engaging with individuals. The Rome team is an interdisciplinary team that includes a therapist, peers with lived experience, and a psychiatrist. Our staff are out on the street interacting daily with our homeless population, providing services to get people off the streets and engaged in treatment whichever happens first. We have two teams working in groups of two, currently targeting 25 people in the downtown and Oildale area who've been identified as being the most difficult to engage, the most vulnerable because of their mental health issues. The Rome staff are traveling in recognizable vans that are equipped with a broad variety of material that they use and share with individuals to help build trust and rapport. I've gone out with the Rome team several times to understand more about the work they're doing and the people that they're serving. This population is very challenging. They're unique with their needs, their preferences, and their circumstances. The trauma they've experienced is intense and their mental illness is significant. They're using substances which make them mo both more vulnerable and more challenging to work with. One of the challenges we're encountering is the resistance to accessing housing options that we have available. They don't want to leave the street despite their dire and unsafe living conditions. And while we're incredibly excited 
and supportive of our two new low barrier navigation centers, we're finding that these individuals can be so mentally ill that we need to have other resources available for them for initial housing. The shelters may be too stimulating and these clients just may be too ill for those environments. Having a variety of housing resources is one of the most important elements to making this outreach successful. Having the right placement available when they're ready to accept help is essential. Recognizing this, we're building out as much as we can. We're using existing crisis residential, our Frizy Hope House. We use hotel vouchers when we can. We're using the navigation centers and we have reserved beds in both facilities. And we're working with our partners to help understand what other resources we need to maximize the opportunities to get these individuals off the street. One of the most exciting elements of our pilot is the inclusion of street psychiatry. We've added a psychiatrist to our team. He's riding in the van, building relationships with our target population, even completing psychiatric evaluations and addressing medication needs on the street. Here to tell you a little bit more about what we're doing is our BHRS medical director, Dr. Garth Alingo. It's a privilege and an honor to uh, speak this morning. I'd just like to give a little context of, of how I happen to be here. I did my training in Loma Linda, uh, just down the road from here, and my residency right here at UCLA Kern. After doing residency training, I did my fellowship training right here in this community. And the wonderful thing about uh, Kern Behavioral Health and Recovery Services in partnership with the UCLA uh, Kern uh, program is that it has manufactured psychiatrists who have actually stayed in the community. Uh, even psychiatrists working at other facilities in the community were trained or worked at the UCLA Kern program. So what does that have to say? It means the burden of the homeless is on the hearts of the trainees and on the hearts of the faculty. And we are delighted to work together with Kern Behavioral Health and Recovery Services in reaching out to the disenfranchised and those on the periphery uh, to somehow give them some hope and um, bring them back in to community. So how do we do this? One thing that we teach our trainees, our residents and our fellows is that we have to have contact with individuals. That means going out and meeting them where they are. When we have contact, then we can win their confidence. And how do we win their confidence? By caring for them, by showing that we really have their best interests at heart. And we do that by compassionate and consistent care. And we've seen that once we've done that and built a therapeutic alliance, then we can make the call to call them out of their situations and bring them to housing, not just passing through housing, but actually retaining that. And one thing that we've learned from the other programs uh, around the country, and why I say that, is that street psychiatry is something very new. There's no residency program in it. There's no fellowship in street psychiatry. But what there is, is a burgeoning interest to help those who need the help. And so what we're doing now is we're training individuals who will stay in the community and make a difference and make our community a wonderful community and bring that wonder and sense of hope to those who are the most hopeless. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alengo. One of the most significant areas I'm undertaking for our department is how we evaluate the inherent vulnerability of suffering with untreated mental illness while living on the street. We're currently reassessing how we evaluate 5150 involuntary holds for grave disability. Many of the homeless individuals we encounter are not able to provide for appropriate food, shelter, or other basic needs for themselves due to the severity of their mental illness. They may meet criteria for grave disability and consequently a 5150 hold, which likely results in inpatient hospitalization. The Kern Rome staff are trained to assess for 5150 criteria. In fact, those were, that was an item on the agenda today that your board approved, um, were three 5150 certifications for our Rome team. 
Um, this, our model allows them to spend the time they need with individuals to document and determine if this criteria is met. While not all homeless people are gravely disabled because of their mental illness, for those that are, psychiatric hospitalization will be needed to stabilize them on medication, reduce their symptoms, improve their ability to care for themselves. We've already seen a number of our Kern Rome clients need inpatient psychiatric hospitalization. We, we absolutely expect to see more as we go forward. We spoke recently with the LA um, homeless outreach team working very similar to what we're trying to do here. They reported 80% of the individuals they work with are going to need inpatient hospitalization at some point during their treatment. The LA homeless team shared how relevant it was for them to have the relationship between the inpatient unit and their treatment team. They go so far as to reserve inpatient beds when they think they're going to need to use one to make sure that the bed is available um, at the time, recognizing also how important the interaction between the inpatient team and the homeless outreach team is. Um, this is so relevant for discharge planning, the inpatient hospitalization really is an opportunity to try to transition somebody into supportive housing and get them off the street. Assessing individuals working with the inpatient units to ensure those who meet criteria for LPS conservatorship are referred for this evaluation is especially important, even, uh, as underlined when they are inpatient. The team, our team, the Rome team, will follow the individual while they're inpatient, ensure inpatient staff have all the necessary information to determine whether the individual requires longer term involuntary treatment services through a conservatorship. This has been a necessary step. Just as we're working internally to shift our culture about the vulnerabilities of homelessness and 5150 criteria, we also need to work with our partners to ensure that these vulnerabilities are recognized when they're inpatient and that they're engaged for further evaluation and planning for their safety. When an individual is conserved, the county conservator through aging and adult services makes decisions on behalf of an individual pertaining to both their mental health treatment and their housing and placement. This option is appropriate for individuals who continue to be gravely disabled even after their inpatient hospitalization. For individuals who have multiple um, incarcerations or psychiatric hospitalizations, we're using referrals for assisted outpatient treatment. Assisted outpatient treatment, otherwise known as Laura's Law, is the involuntary treatment option for individuals who have acute symptoms, multiple psychiatric hospitalizations or incarcerations, and their mental health condition continues to deteriorate because they are not engaging in mental health treatment. The process to involuntary, involuntarily engage somebody in treatment through assisted outpatient treatment involves a petition to the court. Through this process, the individual may be compelled to engage through a court order without requiring psychiatric hospitalization. Involuntary treatment involves hospitalizations and we're working to ensure we have capacity at our inpatient units to treat our homeless individuals. We've also added acute care, outpatient, housing placement options for individuals if they don't meet criteria for involuntary services. We use, as I said, our crisis residential, Frizy Hope House, and are working up with an enhanced adult residential facility. So our Rome team has started out with some really good outcomes in the few months that we've been working. As I've stated earlier, we have a really small team right now. We're targeting 25 people overall. And for those 25 people, we've placed 10 people in housing, Six of them remain placed in housing. Um, four of them left the housing that we, we put them in. We've written three 5150 holds and all three resulted in inpatient hospitalizations. We've made six referrals to AOT and we have had three of our Rome clients receive a psych eval on the street and a total of seven people overall have been working with our psychiatrist. Before your board today is the renewal, renewal of the Bakersfield Flood Ministries Agreement. 
I want to thank your board for continuing to support these efforts to address homelessness in, improving, in approving this contract. Flood Bakersfield Ministries provides a wide range of services and support to help our homeless population achieve and maintain long-term stability and permanent housing. Their program includes homeless street outreach and housing case management services. They have a dedicated team and they work with individuals for up to two years to ensure that they stay successful in their permanent housing placement. BHRS is working closely with Flood to review the success of the Rome model and to find ways to make these combined efforts more successful to address our homeless challenges. Flood has been very successful in working to get individuals off the street, but we wanna consider how to make their efforts even more impactful for our community. We're anticipating narrowing the range of some of their work so that they can be really more successful and more targeted in what they're doing. But I also wanted to share during the three years they've been working directly with BHRS, they've served 1,210 unique individuals. They've placed 960 individuals in temporary or permanent shelters or housing through the homeless outreach program. I saw them this morning out on the street working with somebody as I drove to the board this, um, just on my way here. While successful outreach and engagement is critical in, access, in addressing the needs of our homeless, keeping these individuals engaged once they've accepted assistance is its own challenge. We have a plan to implement a new evidence-based approach, critical, critical time intervention through our homeless adult team for Rome individuals. Appropriate residential options are critical for individuals moving from the street. Uh, the needs and preferences for each individual need to be considered. And for many, individuals prefer living in single occupancy placements. They wanna live with their domestic partners or they want placement with their pets. Accommodating these needs is challenging, but we will continue to work with our partner agencies to expand residential options for individuals. For those with acute care needs, we need high level residential care and additional inpatient psychiatric beds. We're working to establish medical detox for substance use. Prop 47 has introduced some new changes. Most drug offenses are now classified as misdemeanors and the department has seen a significant reduction in court ordered substance use treatment, meaning many who would benefit from treatment are not compelled to engage. Getting those who need mental health services to engage in treatment continues to be a significant challenge. We have limited options to compel individuals into treatment, but we're working actively to use all of the tools we have to support treatment for those who need it the most. We're working with aging and adult services to look at how community conservatorship can be utilized locally. This would allow us to consider LPS conservatorships without having to hospitalize somebody. Services that we're providing currently for homeless outreach are not billed to Medi-Cal. We don't generate revenue from these services. That's because most of the individuals we're serving don't have insurance. So these, these services and these resources are 100% draw on our realignment funding. So we have, to be we have to continue to be innovative on how we're funding these services, balancing the service need with our fiscal sustainability. Despite these challenges, we're committed to finding long-term solutions to address homelessness and ensure treatment for homeless, the homeless with mental illness continues. Going forward, we plan to continue to pursue these long-term goals. We're gonna to continue to work with Aging and Adult Services, the Conservator's Office, to explore options for community conservatorship. We're planning to expand the Kern Rome program creating MHSA innovation plan to draw down additional funding so we can expand our pilot program. And we need to consider additional housing options, uh, work with our partner agencies, private entities for additional enhanced residential facilities, maybe tiny homes, permanent supportive housing, any other type of housing that we can use to meet the needs for this really complex population. 
I'd like to thank the board for the opportunity to present on our efforts. Um, I appreciate the community impact on homelessness has, and what it has for our residents and our businesses and the immediate safety issues that are present for the homeless person living on the street. This is an urgent issue and I'd like to reassure the board that our department is working hard to help these individuals. What you can expect from us is that we'll continue to be innovative, creative, and resourceful when it comes to our approach for working with the homeless. We'll continue to relentlessly engage and, and persevere every single day. We're taking immediate steps to try new things. We're changing our department culture, and we're working with our contractors to ensure better, better utilization and outcomes for all of the services provided. For today, it's recommended that your board approve the agreement with Bakersfield Flood Ministries and authorize the chairman to sign. Thank you. This concludes my presentation. Thank you, Ms. Kohara. I know this is a critical issue for Kern County and uh, it's, you just drive down the street and you can see how it affects our community everywhere. And uh, I just think it's fantastic all the, uh, the efforts and the ways you guys are innovating to try and tackle this problem. So. Uh, my, my hat's off to you. Uh, Supervisor Maggard, do you want to jump in? Yes, Mr. Chairman, thank you. <clears throat> First, I want to thank uh, Director Kuwahara for fully embracing this issue. Uh, the, um, as we look back, on, I'm confident that as we move forward, we will come to a point that we will recognize we've made a serious difference in getting mentally ill homeless people off the street. And that will affect the quality of life, not only for them, but for all those neighborhoods in which they are currently roaming and, and, uh, and, and are lost. So today is the tipping point to, to that changing and not, not being like that anymore. And uh, that is largely due to our director, Kuahara, embracing this issue. So thank you for that. And uh, our entire community is going to thank you for that as we move forward. It is an uncertain outcome. and. Uh, we are not assured of everything that we want to see happen happen, but it is the, the first step in making it happen. So I want to thank you for that. Uh, the, there are several issues I want to just touch on. Uh, and first of all, I want to thank you for the tremendous hire that you have made in Dr. Uh, Alongo. Thank you for your comments. Bringing hope to the most hopeless is uh, a profound, um, perspective, I'm grateful that you are there and willing to go wherever it takes you on the streets to meet those people who are really the most uh, without hope, the most hopeless amongst us. I can't think of a more terrifying, uh, I, I've experienced some mental illness in my extended family and um, I can't think of a more terrifying circumstance than, you know, the, even though it's not real, it sure seems real to the person who's ill. And uh, to be out, particularly women who are out in that vulnerable, that susceptible to manipulation and harm, um, to be lost like that, it's, it's a terrifying uh, existence. Uh, in, the, in the last six weeks, uh, Director Kuahara and I have discussed uh, a, a lady, it happens that two of these experiences were with ladies, a lady on California Avenue, interestingly, ironically, just east of our Department of Human Services building, late at night, she is flailing about in her lost, mentally ill state, wanders into traffic, is struck by a car and killed. Um, a, a death that was preventable had she not been in that circumstance. I have encountered in the last 10 days a, a, another lady who uh, I was in line at a fast food place and she, I, you know, this person came up behind me and was almost touching my back, she was so close to me. Uh, I turned and looked at her and she backed away, but a moment later she was right back at my back again. And I had to turn and, and remind her, don't stand so close to me. And as I looked her in the eye, she was completely lost. She did not comprehend a thing about the moment that we were in or my interacting with her. The next day, I am uh, again in the same neighborhood. This happened on Mount Vernon, uh, six blocks north on Mount Vernon, uh, uh, across the street from Bearsville College. I notice uh, a person asleep in the street, covered in blankets, so you wouldn't know uh, that this was a person, but I stopped and uh, looked, and uh, bottom line is, it's the same woman, lost in her mind, 
asleep in the street near the entrance to a shopping center. She is not going to live if she is not found and taken off the street. Those are the kind of people that we are trying to make a difference in uh, the lives of. And I, I cannot tell you enough how grateful I am, uh, Ms. Kuhara, for your, your dedication to doing something about that. And uh, I, I just cannot wait for it to move forward. It means that we have to change some things. Uh, e even in our hospitals, there was one of the very first people that uh, Ms. Kuhara told me about taking off the street uh, was admitted to a hospital uh, involuntarily, but admitted to a hospital. And the very next day, released from that hospital. Immediately went back on the street and immediately relapsed. We, we even have to change the culture in our treating facilities. Um, so th th this is a, com a comprehensive uh, 180 degree, 360 degree, not just side to side, 360 degree uh, revision of the way we've handled this. But um, what you said, Ms. Kuhara, about uh, unsafe circumstances, dire and unsafe living circumstances is the case. And the, the, the real pivotal shift here the, the tipping point is that our new director is willing to intervene in those lives and take them off the street and put them into a, a treatment facility. So whatever you need to get that done, I'm interested in doing. And I'm confident that my colleagues are interested in doing. And I know that our community is interested in your doing. So please tell us what those things are and we will help you in that regard. Uh, as a little uh, a side note, uh, you, you pointed out that not every person that we get off the street uh, that's suffering from mental illness is a suitable fit for our low barrier navigation center or the city's low barrier navigation center. By the way, I toured that recently. They are doing a marvelous job there and I, I commend them for that. But we are doing a marvelous job as well and I commend us for the tremendous efforts that are uh, in place uh, at, at our low barrier uh, navigation center. Can you tell us, Mr. Alsop, uh, where are we now? We, we had to throttle back on uh, when we opened as to our capacity because of COVID. But with uh, those things um, progressing, where are we now with regard to the capacity that we are operating at and when will we be able to get to full, full capacity? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Supervisor Maggard, I'd like to, um, in answering this, thank uh, our partnership with CAPK, who, as you know, are uh, managing that facility for us um, there at M Street. Um, they've been maintaining about a 75% capacity for some time now uh, due to the pandemic. And uh, we intend to be at full capacity by uh, the very end of June, uh, if not before. Uh, so those transitions are underway. Uh, again, uh, it will be uh, you know, congruent with the uh, direct any any forthcoming directives of the state and obviously the uh, the numbers uh, related to COVID it, uh, it, itself, uh, but that's the plan to be at full capacity uh, by the end of June. And as you know, full capacity is uh, 150 uh, beds. Very good, thank you. I'm eager for that to be the case. And every person we get off the street is another person that is uh, not only are we making a difference in their life, but we're saving in those neighborhoods from suffering the consequences. Uh, you know, there's, there are increasing consequences downtown in, in the area that's in the city of Bakersfield, but in the third district, uh, just north of, of uh, 24th Street, uh, there, there's been a, a rash of fires set by uh, some lost person. Um, and uh, those, it, it isn't uh, straight up, um, uh, somebody setting fires on purpose, there, there's a problem in that neighborhood and, and that needs to be dealt with. So this, is, this affects not only, I'm making that point because it affects the neighborhoods that they're from as well. Lastly, and then I'll, I'll, I'll uh, make the, the motion to approve this, um, but lastly, can you uh, speak to us for just a moment about how we change the focus of and the ability of flood under this new contract to, to take these kinds of people off the street and to intervene uh, where necessary uh, when the, the 5150 hold and uh, a residential treatment program is necessary. 
Uh, thank you, Supervisor Maggard, through the chair. Um, flood Ministries is, is staffed a little bit differently. They use a lot of peers in their work and their outreach and have, have had a very broad mandate um, to target a wide number of individuals. And so we're, we're working with Jim Wheeler um, with Flood Ministries to really look at um, how do we how do we narrow their focus a bit? Um, how do we support their staff with the training that um, in the Rome model and some of these new models that we're looking at? Um, I would really like to see the homeless um, outreach contact number that our community can use um, to have outcomes that the community feels are really effective and meaningful for them. And so we're actively speaking with Mr. Wheeler and his team on some of these new ideas for how we might make their effort very specific and targeted to have a, a bigger impact. I have complete confidence in and absolute respect for Mr. Wheeler and his, his team and what they're doing. What we're talking about though is a shift in perspective and they are our most capable uh, hands uh, and feet on the street to, to make that difference. So uh, I know that they're willing to partner with us in that, but I'm just signaling, signaling to you and to them and to our community that uh, a shift in how that's being done to help us get off the street, those that are the most um, vulnerable, the most in danger to themselves and others, and uh, the, the most disruptive to our community, how we can make a difference in those lives. So thank, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, please let us know what we can do to help you. I am grateful for the support of my colleagues in this effort. And, uh, and I want to tell you again, thank you for your help. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Supervisor Maggard. Supervisor Perez. Uh, well, Stacy, this is uh, the most exciting plan I've seen come out of your department. Uh, and I'm, uh, I really feel a sense of competence and efficacy that uh, makes me feel very hopeful. And I'm so delighted to hear from uh, your colleague, uh, the psychiatrist, forgive me, I don't remember your name, but I loved your words, I loved your heart, uh, because this work, you know, as I like to say, is God's work, right? It is the absolute hardest work. It is, takes the absolute best of us with grace and compassion, uh, in particular to people who uh, m so much of society just doesn't believe deserves that. And so there's a frustration and an anger and, a, and you know, and, and there's a lot at stake here. And so uh, the tone and the spirit by which you approach this matter, I think is profound and important. And I'm really, really excited uh, for what the next stage looks like. It seems to me, Stacy, that we have a real opportunity here in January to get an accurate count on the numbers. Uh, of course, we can't manage what we don't uh, you know, follow very closely. We, we have no clue how many people are out there, frankly. And it seems like we have some time to build up a network of volunteers for that. And it's a great way to invite members of the community to do something meaningful on homeless that is very short uh, commitment, that is not overwhelming, but also in, is enlightening and has the ability to build community and bring people together. So I really am hopeful that we, you know, you have lots on your plate, so do I, but that would be something I would very much be interested in championing with you and making sure that we have as many volunteers out as possible because I think we can engage them to be even more involved once they get a, a sense in a, a, of what's out there and just how heartbreaking and tragic it really is on so many levels. So this is hopeful, it's exciting. Uh, I do want to know some details about Frizy House, but uh, please, please, uh, let's meet about the count in January and how we engage all members of our community who are desperate to do something. I hear from them all the time, what can we do? And it feels so daunting. This is something that we can do that gives us accuracy, allows us to manage uh, a process that you know we're going to need to see real reductions in and make sense of the taxpayer's investment, uh, obviously. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, I don't know if you want to comment on that now. You don't have to. But where's the Frizy House? Uh, is this the same process to get into the Frizy House as we've had before that has always been cumbersome? And I'm not the expert, so I just mean that's a cumbersome process. Uh, the bed, is the bed space full? Uh, you know, where are we with that? Uh, thank you, uh, Supervisor Perez, through the chair. Frizy House... Um, you know, their, their census and daily capacity changes because it's, it's a facility often used by our inpatient beds, but we are working with them. Uh, it's really, 
finding the right fit for the person that we're working with and whether or not that's a good option for them. Hmm. Uh, a lot of the individuals that we're working with, um, the preferred initial intervention would likely be an inpatient hospitalization because it gets them someplace safe where they can begin medication. Um, working with them and evaluating them to determine the criteria for that 5150 hold is something that often takes time. Building their trust to um, engage somebody to be willing to come into any level of a placement it takes takes time. I was actually a little surprised at how much more challenging that is. Mm -hmm. So we're just trying everything and all things to see what works and, and how it works and how it can be improved. Is, does Frizy have the nursing staff to administer medication right now? I believe yes. Okay. I don't, I don't think they used to. I can't remember, but you think so? Yes. Yes. Yes, they do. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate that. Okay, very good. Well, I look forward to meeting with you on this, uh, but really the uh, consummate professionalism and focus on outcomes with you know, the right heart is what I see, and, and that makes me very hopeful. So again, I look forward to meeting, uh, what's the psychiatrist's Do name again? Forgive Dr. Me? Alengo. Alengo, great name. Thank you, and, and, and Godspeed to you. It's a big job, but it's one in which we can manage, especially if we do it as a community. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Perez. Uh, are there any other board comments? Okay. Um, did we have any uh, pu uh, public comment on this? No, Mr. Chairman. No public comment on items 22 or 23. Great. Thank you. I'll, I'll second the motion that Supervisor Maggard made to approve item number 23. Thank you. Please cast your votes. The motion is approved, all ayes. Thank you. Okay, we will now consider item number 24, also under Behavioral Health and Recovery Services, and that is the proposed construction of two psychiatric health care facilities and authorization to secure funding, and I will turn it back over to Ms. Kuhara. All right, thank you again, uh, Chairman Peters and members of the board. I'm here today to present and request approval on the construction of two psychiatric health facilities. These facilities will provide 16 psychiatric inpatient treatment beds for adults and 16 beds for minors. We're asking the board to authorize the release for a request for statement of qualifications and subsequent release of a request for proposals to choose a design build entity. We're also requesting authorization for the financing plan for this project. Preliminary estimates provide for a $25,480,000 project cost. The PUFF project has been in development uh, by Kern BHRS since 2017. We initially brought it to your board in June of 2019 and most recently in November of 2020. Your board has taken actions to approve the RFP for the contracting provider, the consulting agreement for the design and the approval of the purchase of the land, and last year your board approved the RFP award and agreement for construction management and bridging architect. During the previous presentation for the for the request for statement of qualifications and the request for proposal and the financing plan, approval was delayed as specific questions were brought forward by your board. In the last five months, we've worked with our inpatient providers to address their concerns that they've raised during that presentation. Two of our four inpatient providers have continued to express concerns about this project going forward, and I anticipate they may do so today. Issues they've identified are the appropriate use of taxpayer dollars and the proposal for current private providers to be able to meet this need. I'd like to point out to your board that neither of these providers applied when the RFP was issued and therefore could not be considered in the award for this project. We are proposing a public-private partnership for the psychiatric health facilities. BHRS owns the land and will build the facility. A contracted provider will operate services for the program. 
Um, this model was used in the construction of the jail facility. Um, as you recall, that project was completed on time and under budget. Uh, Kern County and the city of Bakersfield have built two new homeless navigation centers in a very similar manner to which we're proposing. Both the county and the city own, own the land and the facilities, but have contracted out for the service provider, uh, for the services provided in, in those facilities. This ensures that the county or the city can maintain these essential services, even if the need to address contractor needs changes. The need for additional inpatient psychiatric care in Kern County was identified many years ago. Over the last five years, we've seen significant increases in the number of adults and minors waiting at our psychiatric evaluation center over 23 hours. These are adults and minors needing inpatient hospitalization, but are held over at the psychiatric evaluation center because an inpatient bed is not available. In fiscal year 1718 to 1819, we saw a 318% increase in adults and minors over 23 hours. We saw a significant increase in adults and minors waiting over even 72 hours. These are our trends and increases that were recognized before COVID. The data trends from 1819 to 1920 continue to show the need for more inpatient beds as we continue to see greater increase at the PEC unit. 125% increase in 23 hours and 137% increase in stays over 72 hours. COVID has had a significant impact on our inpatient bed availability. However, in the last six months from January to December, our data showed 438 adults and minors waiting at the PEC over 23 hours. This is almost the full total of individuals we had for the entire year in fiscal year 1920. While COVID has impacted inpatient bed availability, we expect that as the pandemic restrictions improve, the ongoing mental health needs for adults and minors will only increase. As we discussed in my earlier presentation, BHRS is making significant strides to outreach to homeless individuals living on the street. We know that many of these individuals have significant, significant mental illness, and as a result of our aggressive outreach, our efforts will result in more 5150s and greater utilization of our inpatient beds. As I reported previously, um, the LA team reported 80% of the individuals they were targeting needed inpatient psychiatric care. We're already seeing this in our own efforts. Um, in the two months our team was operational, 12% of the 25 that we targeted already required inpatient hospitalization. I'd like to introduce Dr. Mohamed Mola. He is the joint chair of our Kern Behavioral Health and Recovery Services and Kern Medical Residency Program. He works with both of our departments and works directly in our clinical care. Thank you, Stacy, and a respected chair and uh, members of the board. Uh, as we just looked at the numbers at the previous slides, uh, we have seen many uh, of our patients ended up staying in the uh, Mary Kay Shell building at PEC over 23 hours. And what it means is that care was delayed. And there is a term in medical, uh, and I think it applies to many other places, care delayed is care denied. At least for the period of time when the person was supposed to be an inpatient unit did not receive that service that we are all supposed to or bounded to provide to. So uh, I kind of, uh, in lieu of that understanding, I would like to say that how we can improve the patient's care and patient outcome. So I would probably share a couple of important things that is important uh, uh, for us to understand that uh, the existing care that we have in the city, which is great, and I, we need their partnership, we need their help, but there is a need, uh, is exceeds the supply that we have right now with the beds in the hospitals that we have right now. Um, also at the same time, a couple of concerns came up uh, in last couple of months of discussion that we have that uh, there's a uh, county being too strict uh, asking for uh, a level of staffing in the inpatient services, uh, which was a concern for cost effectiveness that came up too. 
I wanted to share one thing about this staffing is that each staff means a care to the patient that the patient receives from that staff. It could be a physician, it could be a social worker, it could be a case manager. And that significantly helped that person to get better sooner, to get the appropriate level of care. And it could be someone who's doing every 15 minutes check in a unit, which is very important to ensure safety of that person who is in an acute psychiatric inpatient setting, it doesn't matter wherever it is. So I would like to share that that concern brings me to that understanding of that the focus shouldn't be just only cost effectiveness or business purposes. It should be the patient care should be the priority. At least I would like to share that is priority for us. So another important thing is to improve care and the outco outcome is by retention of physician. And one of our partners not able to retain a physician and many physician left uh, from working there and all the physicians working, many of the physicians are, physicians are working, those who doesn't reside in county. Uh, of course, due to many reasons that we need to uh, provide coverages to the telepsychiatry that care clearly understood. But when, when it comes down to care and understanding the need of the county, especially when I'm gonna, I'll be talking about the minors that were in its family meetings done by the child and adolescent psychiatrist, uh, coordinating care, uh, it's just not the inpatient psychiatric unit, unit, especially for minors, is just giving them another medication. It's a lot of care coordination needs to happen. And when the physician is not there in person, not able to coordinate this care with the team, the care is compromised. So we would like to, by proposing uh, the care that we're talking about, by improving patient outcome. When we have physicians working in the community, they're always available. Every person who's being admitted from an inpatient, uh, outpatient setting to inpatient setting, something didn't work for them. It could be outpatient psychiatrists couldn't adjust the medication that would need to be done. There are certain sensitive medications needs to be recommended when someone, someone gets admitted to the inpatient setting that needs very close monitoring. And that needs communication. So the, on the other side, the physician who's working in patient setting needs to be available at all the time. And there's a significant concern about retention, recruitment and retention that we are seeing that there is not a physician, one single physician is providing care at all the time and there is always a switch and change. So that's something needs to be addressed and I strongly believe that what we are proposing probably would be significantly add value to the care that we're talking about right now. We already did talk about the re re reduction in long st uh, stay in the crisis unit and improving the delay in treatment at the beginning of, uh, of my uh, talk. Uh, another important things are happening uh, as we saw in the previous slide that many um, adults and minors, mostly minors, were sent out of county for their care. And this is significant as a child and adolescent psychiatry and my colleague Dr. Olango here as a child and adolescent psychiatrist, we clearly understand that sending a minor out of county means their parents cannot meet with their family, uh, with, the, with their minor, in a family meeting setting that we sometimes need to do a couple of times a week. So I think we have to have a solution for that for our minors, those who live in Kern County. So a uh, couple of other things I think important that uh, we have one unit right now in the city or in the county that takes only minors. I think our parents doesn't matter, it's in pay, uh, county individuals, what I mean by that Medicaid population or indigent population, or it could be private insured patients like one of our uh, family members. There has to be choices available for them to really understand that uh, uh, which something is very important that we're all talking about patients is to have their choices, where do they go? So having multiple options is always favorable for the patients and their family to choose, depending on the care provided uh, in the county. It's, we saw some numbers about uh, our um, uh, patients waiting at Mary Kay Shell building at PEC. I will share one thing that it does not include the patients, those who are w uh, waiting at Kern Medical Emergency Department or on the medical floor of Kern Medical Center, uh, that they're still waiting for a bed either at Kern Medical Inpatient Unit or somewhere in, uh, else in the other hospitals. So that means the number is higher than what we already looked at right now. Uh, so one another thing that is very important to understand is that the number clearly indicates that there's a growth of population that has happened when I came here in 2005, probably doubled by now, which is 900,000 approximately that number of population. So 2019, California Hospital Association published their 
California Psychiatry Bed Annual Report from 2018. And one of their expert opinions suggests that there needs to be one bed per uh, 2,000, uh, uh, sorry, per, for uh, 6,000, um, uh, uh, my, my mistake, one bed for 2,000 people, so that in, indicates about 450 beds that we need in our county. We, just before that, the beginning onset of our discussion, we heard about during the homeless projects, there's a one in five has mental illness. So we cannot just ignore this. And currently we have 150 beds. Other hospitals might think about, they will have many more beds, which is very welcome because our county needs it. And this 16 plus 16, 32 beds still will be way lower than the expect, uh, expected beds that we'll have. If it is not in two to three years, for sure by 10 years, we're gonna hit this problem. And then probably we'll bring it to our attention again. So I really appreciate that our county mental health, current behavioral health and recovery service really focusing on the future, not only on the current issues that we are talking about right now. And another long-term and cost-effective uh, solution, which would be my last topic a little bit to discuss, is that uh, I have worked at BBHS, which used to be uh, uh, Good Sam Southwest. Uh, when I joined here, and I was uh, uh, recruited for uh, being the uh, county inpatient psychiatrist. And that's where our county individual is to go. Uh, and, and I was the first psychiatrist to be at Taft too. Uh, I used to uh, see patients in the morning at the Good Sam Southwest and then drive to Taft every afternoon. At that time, the care coordination that we developed, child psychiatrists in the county, when we talk to them right now, when their patient is inpatient, they refer to that was the best time because the care that needs our county was provided, which is unique. I know that a county probably might end up sharing many others that it is difficult for them to do any um, uh, in a business model is not profitable. When I came from Los Angeles, joined as a child adolescent uh, psychiatry faculty, I found that what a big, huge county couldn't provide, that our county provide that appropriate care for not only for their minors, for their adults too. Every client admitted to the inpatient unit, there's a case manager or therapist who will go to the unit and see this client to bridge the gap. So the, our clients doesn't get lost, our patient doesn't get lost after discharge from the hospital. This is appropriate care and I was very happy to see that. And we shouldn't lose that vision either. It is not the care should go down, care should go up. Even appropriateness, that is important to understand. And giving to the same, uh, pointing to the same example, that care has changed in the same hospital because the ownership has changed, CO has changed, many other reasons has changed, and the interest has changed, probably the financial focus has changed. So that doesn't give us a long-term cost-effective solution for the county, where county came up with a budget that um, uh, Ms. Kuhara is gonna share with us that it is a cost-effective effect solution that we are looking for. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mola. Our analysis and partnership with the county CAO's office has demonstrated that building and funding the PUF as proposed will allow our department to optimize funds to increase the inpatient beds for our community, save money, and with those cost savings, fund services greatly needed in our community, including our homeless outreach, jail-based services, substance use services, and other services that cannot be billed directly to Medi-Cal. There have been many statements made recently through public forums that this plan is an excessive use of taxpayer dollars and is not cost efficient. This is inaccurate. You can see outlined in this table, we have three different types of inpatient facilities in Kern County. General acute care hospitals, an institute of mental disorders, and a puff. General acute care hospitals have higher costs and day rates overall because they provide different services. They're an inpatient facility located in a medical hospital and they can take clients who have significant medical needs. These facilities provide services to individuals who cannot be served in an IMD or a PUF. The IMD presents a fiscal challenge because for adults aged 22 to 64, the IMD cannot bill Medi-Cal. The day rate for those facilities for this age group is 100% funded through realignment funding. The PUF offers an overall 
a lower overall day rate and allows Medi-Cal billing. The impact on realignment funding is 50% less than the IMD. This table shows the overall costs for each type of facility and in orange, the draw on our realignment funding. As I said earlier, we use our realignment funding to provide services that are really essential, including all of our jail-based services, housing resources, homeless services, substance use services. We are using our realignment in every single part of our mental health provision. Yes, a private entity could build a facility faster and maybe with less initial building cost. However, over the long term, the costs of building out through a private provider would actually be more expensive. If one of our existing inpatient providers were to build a facility or expand their existing facility, those expenses would be added into the existing day rates and driving up these already expensive costs even more indefinitely. We compared the annual cost of the four inpatient facilities we have here in Kern, uh, reducing them down to a 16 bed model for comparison purposes. The graph, this graph shows the comparison of cost on an annual basis across the different types of facilities we have and the impacts on our funding based on if we can bill Medi-Cal and how much realignment would be used. Adding a psychiatric health facility, which has a low bed day rate, and for which I'll be able to bill Medi-Cal for 50%, I'm able to show you the savings we accept to, expect to maintain on an annual basis. This is an estimate, but at a minimum, 2.8 million taxpayer dollars a year in our realignment costs when we're able to use a puff for our Medi-Cal beneficiaries. This project will be funded through a financing plan. BHRS will make payments with federal and state administrative and realignment funds. BHRS is the state contracted mental health plan serving as the managed care entity for Medi-Cal beneficiaries in Kern County. As the mental health plan, BHRS will have opportunities to draw down from Medi-Cal administrative funds to offset the cost. Additionally, we're anticipating grant opportunities coming forward next year that will go specifically toward infrastructure if awarded. We've been working with the auditor, the CAO's office, and the state controller to ensure BHRS is able to fund the construction without general fund dollars. The state controller has established a mechanism that ensures the allocation of capital cost is made to federal and state programs. Our financing plan will not have any impact on the county's debt capacity and will not require an increase in general fund contributions or maintenance of efforts. In conclusion, the county needs more inpatient beds. The demand's been evident before COVID. It's been exacerbated by COVID. It will continue to increase as our population increases. We're encouraging our current providers to expand their capacity. And we anticipate even with their expansion, we will continue to have a need for these additional 32 beds. The PUF will allow us much needed service provision, especially as we focus on our homeless activities. We've worked closely with the CAO's office and we've developed a fiscally prudent plan that will allow the maximization of our taxpayer dollars, both in our long-term costs for the construction and in preserving realignment dollars that fund our additional essential services. I appreciate your time and consideration of this matter today. This project has been delayed twice already and ongoing delays will add more costs to the project. Further delays only add to the issues we're currently addressing and our residents continue to need treatment. It's recommended that your board approve the construction of two psychiatric health facilities and authorize the department to proceed with the selection processes, including the request for statement of qualifications and the request for proposals. It's also requested that your board authorize the chief general services officer to distribute and authorize the county administrative office to finalize the fi financing plan. Thank you. This concludes my presentation. Thank you, Ms. Gohara. Madam Clerk, have we received any public comment on this item? 
Yes, Mr. Chairman, we have. And we're going to start with uh, two voice messages that were sent in, one from Cindy Gill and one from a, uh, a voice message where the caller declined to give their name. So we'll hear those two voice messages first. Thank you. My name is Cindy Gill, C-I-N-D-Y, Gill, G-I-L-L. And I am calling to urge the Board of Supervisors to approve the two new psychiatric health facilities on the agenda for tomorrow's meeting. I am a past president and a 20-year board member of the local NAMI, which is the National Alliance on Mental Illness. I am also a trained educator and support group facilitator for families when they seek help for their ill relatives. As a family member myself of a loved one with a mental health condition, I know personally what a crisis is and how difficult it is to get the proper care when needed. For many years, there has been a critical need for additional beds and services. I currently take all the calls for the NAMI helpline from family members in crisis looking for help and for facilities to treat their loved ones. The facilities in our area that are uh, available now are inadequate to meet the needs of our community. Again, I urge the Board of Supervisors to approve the two new psychiatric health facilities for Kern County. Thank you. Yes, hello. I'm a member of the Bakersfield community. I live here in Bakersfield, and I also have a very a severely mentally ill loved one that I live with. He has bipolar schizoaffective. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm calling about the mental facilities that are proposing to be built in the city of Bakersfield that has been objected to and has now been delayed since November. Um, I actually just found out about that last night um, and did not have the information to contact, so I do hope this ends up in the meeting. Um, I do have concerns about the number of available beds that we have in Bakersfield for the mentally ill. Um, when I took the family to family class through the National Association of Mental Illness local branch here in town, I would say there were three people in there whose loved ones were unable to get help because there were not facilities to help them and they ended up in a in a criminal uh, setting uh, getting help and being sent to the hospital the fact that it has to turn into a situation where you have to send your loved one to jail to get them help because there simply aren't facilities otherwise is extremely troubling um, about 1.3% of the population statistically is schizophrenic or schizoaffective. We have three, about 380,000 people here in Bakersfield. That means there's about 5,000 schizophrenics here in Bakersfield. Um, we do have some great community outpatient clinics. And we need to really build on those and strengthen the effect that they can have they simply aren't going to work for the more severe cases without some kind of long-term residential treatment. Um, three days is not enough to pull somebody out of psychosis and get them even enough. Mr. Chairman, that concludes uh, voice messages. We also received two emails, which uh, your board received via email last night and this morning. Uh, one email is from Cheryl Holsenbake, the second email from Lito Murillo, the Director of Aging and Adult Services, and you have those in front of you. Um, I have multiple callers that are queued in ready to address your board. I'm also aware that our uh, Chief Probation Officer would like to address your board, so maybe we'll hear from him first and then go to the callers. That would be great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Um, T.R. Miracle, Chief Probation Officer. This subject is of a particular interest to me. As you um, all know, probation operates three youth facilities here in Kern County. We provide many services to these youth, including behavioral health services. However, there are times 
when these symptoms are so acute that they need to be transported to a psychiatric facility. There's been multiple occasions when I've had a youth in one of my facilities suffering from such an acute case, um, but there was not space available. So either these youths have to be taken to the PEC and, stay, and kept there, uh, which is not ideal because it's not meant for long-term care, or they have to remain in my facility without receiving the level of care that they need. This is not good for my staff, and it's not good for the mental health of these youth. I think it's very important going forward that the county has more diverse and greater capacity in this area. The need will only grow in the future. Originally, when this was brought back in November, my uh, interest was really only in the juvenile psychiatric facility. However, because of the realignment of the ju uh, Division of Juvenile Justice, which I'll be talking about later this morning, I also have interest in the adult increased capacity because with that realignment, I will have youth up to age 25 in my facilities. I have a, a probation has a long-standing and successful history working with behavioral health and recovery services. I look forward to continuing this relationship with Director Kuahara. I am in support of this item and ask that you move forward on staff's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're now going to hear from callers uh, waiting on the line. Our first caller is Lamar Curley Brandeski. Mr. Brandeski, if you would unmute your phone by pressing star six, you may address the board. Good morning. My name is Lamar Curley Brandeski. You spell that B R A N D Y S K Y. I'm a licensed marriage family therapist, and you may recognize me as a retired deputy director of current behavioral health and recovery services. I'm here to urge my support for the building of a psychiatric health facility. One of the responsibilities I took on during my years at current behavioral health and recovery services was volunteering to work overtime at the psychiatric evaluation center on the weekends. Um, I did this for almost 10 years. I can assure you there were multiple times that we had people we could not transfer out of the facility, um, backing them up and keeping them over. Um, the proposed facility will not be run by current BHRS, but it will be a third party contractor. I happen to have been on the committee reading the RFPs um, and can assure you that our goal was to select the best contractor who could provide quality services. Um, interestingly, some of the complaints I have read about in the newspaper were by organizations that did not submit RFPs, so they were not under consideration for the construction of this facility. Um, interestingly, one of the organizations, if you were to investigate it on the California Department of Public Health website, you will see a number of grievances and complaints that have been filed over the years. In 2020, there were 28 complaints. In 2019, there were 31 complaints. And in 2018, there were 37 complaints against this organization. So just to be brief, I want to say that the community needs this facility. I now have the opportunity to work in other counties where I hear how appreciative they are that they have facilities in Kern County to send both their youth and adults to as these counties do not have facilities. Um, as T.R. Miracle said, um, sending youth out of the county is a grave dis um, uh, problem for the families who then cannot visit their children. Um, thank you very much for this consideration um, and good day. Thank you. Our next speaker is Jeff Chin. Mr. Chin, if you would unmute your phone by pressing star six, you may address the board. Thank you. Uh, oh, thank you, supervisors. My name is Jeff Chin. I'm the CEO at uh, Bakersfield Behavioral. Uh, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, we talked about homelessness. We talked. We're, we're now we're talking about the pup and the pup as being a um, part of the way to combat homelessness. So <clears throat> let me start um, talking about homelessness in general. 
Um, I agree. We do have a homeless um, crisis here in Bakersfield and in Kern County. Um, our our uh, our facility stands ready to to be a part of the solution. Um, up until now, um, to this very moment, we have not been um, asked to be part of it. We have not even been aware of some of the things that Kern BHRS is doing. We would like to be part of the comprehensive solution. Uh, in answering doc, you know, Dr. Mola, um, some of the things that was being asserted about um, physicians not being able to um, not being able to contact physicians. Um, that was the first that I'd heard about it when we discussed that yesterday. I wanted to, I uh, reached out to him to let him know that we are um, definitely want to be a part of um, solution and want to um, foster really good, very good communication. And um, just, so we, we, we stand ready to be part of the the solution to the homeless issue that is um, dear to all of us um, on the Board of Supervisors as well as us here as uh, community partners. Um, so in talking about the puffs, so usually, you know, I've heard that there there is a need, there is a need. We would like to see, you know, we don't see, and I know one of our other partners does not see the um, need that is is discussed. Um, currently, we have 20 beds available for child and adolescent services. Now, we just finished negotiating next year's contract, which is going to be pending before you, hopefully in the next meeting. Uh, we can bring the, those beds online without any cost to the taxpayer or any time waiting for construction. Um, now, I know the, the private sector and Kern BHRS are pretty far apart on how mental health is handled in the county. Um, you know, with the increased collaboration between all of us, I think we can meet the needs with the existing private sector. Uh, if these PUFs, you know, are approved, I believe it will drive away private sector of business away from Kern County and the mental health will become um, basically run by the county. Um, you know, and that's a backward trend and a, I believe a strain on the county resources. Now, during our contract negotiation, um, current BHRS repeatedly said that there was no additional realignment funds available for our contract, yet it seems to us that the funding of these new facilities in large, is in large part from realignment funds. So if the, you know, it's, been presented to us both ways. So the, are the funds scarce or are they not? If they are scarce, then the dollars are going to be taken away from private sector contractors in order to push patients toward the, this pub, the county run pub. <clears throat> so in addition, you know, the patient flow for mental health care in Kern County is highly unusual for our industry. We're pretty far apart on things like admission algorithms, staffing requirements, patient acuity, and the ability for specially trained physicians to write in voluntary holds. So we believe that increased collaboration with BHRS will benefit everyone and we're willing to do so. Um, you know, I know Dr. Alonga stated we wanna give hope to the hope, hopeless. We, we do too. And I know other healthcare providers you know, such as the med surge providers and other um, providers in the county would like to weigh on this, weigh in on this important issue too, as to how they can be part of the solution. Um, so I feel I would like to ask for a 30 day continuance in order so that all members of the healthcare community who really do have a stake in the homeless um, question and solution be allowed to weigh in. And those are my comments um, at the moment. Thank you. Our next uh, caller waiting on the line is Dr. Baga. That's B as in boy, A-G-G-A. -G -G -A. Dr. Baga, if you would unmute your phone by pressing star six, you may address the board.
Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Dr. Bagger. I think everybody pretty much knows me by now. I'm, I talk too much anyways, but uh, uh, good morning. For those of you that don't know me, I'm Dr. Baga. I uh, work over at Good Sam. I'm the program director of the residency program over in Tulare County, far, far away. Uh, and uh, um, like I said, I think most of the most of you know me, supervisors. So thank you again for, for bearing with me and listening to me rant and rave about something that I care about. Uh, so uh, just uh, again, as everybody, I mean, as you guys probably already know, I don't have any financial conflict. I don't work for, I'm not employed by anybody there. I don't, I don't, uh, I, I work at Good Sam. Other than that, I have no financial interest in this. And uh, the only interest that I really have is, is obviously keeping the doctors and my residents uh, in the community. And uh, I think just through the uh, CLIA and the Tulare residency program, just in the last two years, we've been able to keep, uh, and we're keeping two more, so a total, I think, four residents uh, over in uh, Kern County. So, I mean, uh, that's my goal. And uh, that's how I in initially got involved over at Good Sam. Uh, they were the only ones that were willing to, like, warmly open up their arms and, and accept the residents and help them get the training and help them kind of get more connected and con uh, connected to the community. And uh, obviously, that's, that's what our goal is, to be able to retain doctors and to be able to keep them providing the care that they need. So that's where I first got introduced to this. And then I slowly got introduced to this idea of the puff, and I didn't think too much about it before, uh, which then I slowly percolated. And obviously, I overanalyzed things, and I hyperanalyzed things, and I started looking more into it. The more I looked into it, the less and less it makes sense. Uh, so that's why I'm here. I just uh, want to talk about it and make sure that we're making the most sound decision that we can, because unfortunately, I think uh, maybe we're being a little penny-wise, pound foolish uh, would be the thing, and we're not looking at the ripple effects, we're not looking at the ramifications and the rest of the providers, and I've seen kind of the care that we give at Good Sam, and it's just, uh, these people care so much. I mean, 20, oh, we're talking about homelessness, uh, I think 20% of the patients that come into Good Sam uh, are homeless, and a large majority of them uh, we end up taking, even though we don't have approval from current BHRS for payment or from an insurance company, so we don't end up getting uh, reimbursed for a lot of them, but we keep doing it, and that's why I'm kind of here, because I want to I want to make sure that the organizations in the community that are currently taking care of people uh, that have sacrificed so much, and day in and day out, I see these administrators and these nurses and these staff members take care of the sickest most psychiatrically sick, most medically ill, the most addicted patients are having all sorts of comorbidities together. Uh, I just want to make sure that uh, we, aren't, we aren't looking at something uh, uh, in a too microscopic way. Um, I, and uh, the more I look at it, and by, by the way, I just want to appreciate Stacey and, and Dr. Mula, and, and we've had a lot of meetings recently, I mean, as recently as yesterday, and uh, They've, they've opened up about the data, and we've looked at the data, and unfortunately, I, I don't know if we're looking at the data the wrong way or if something's being looked at a different way, but the conclusions that we drew, even as, as close as yesterday, uh, the just getting the financial piece of it out of the way, uh, financially, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, so Good Sam had proposed, uh, I think, at the end of November, uh, and even prior to that, I think as far back as May, uh, we had offered to expand the number of beds. There, there are certain beds that are currently unoccupied and can be converted into mental health beds for a very, very, very minimal cost. So uh, it, I think it's just putting up a door uh, and it will get converted over and then getting some licensing. Um, so we had offered that and it was kind of, didn't get any traction. Uh, and then we ended up re-offering it at the beginning of this year because we keep hearing there is a need, there is a need, there is a need. So we said, okay, I mean, we have the capacity to be able to go up uh, by another 14 beds and we can have it up and ready in about 60 to 90 days. And I think supervisors might know this already from the previous meeting. Uh, when we met, um, it was uh, not very clear, uh, and the message was kind of mixed about the need versus the fiscal issues versus uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I believe uh, one of the comments that was made was um, even if we make an additional 14 beds, uh, the county really only has a need for six. Okay. Uh, so that, that uh, uh, was confusing. Uh, and so we aren't really sure. One part we hear there's a tremendous need. There's an offer uh, for free. There would be no obvious cost to the county to increase these number of beds. Uh, and they would be available a year and eight months 
earlier than any puff would be created, so we would be able to resolve the issues today. Uh, plus, it's in a facility that can provide a much level, higher level of care uh, than a puff would be able to provide, so it can comorbidly treat medical issues, psychiatric issues, uh, and addiction issues. So that was also confusing. Uh, and then the next piece of the puzzle was uh, the actual cost. So uh, we looked at the actual cost, and, and the county was uh, presented what the cost would be. Um, and I think in the end, it ended up being approximately $100 a day difference uh, to treat somebody in a puff that the county would end up paying, uh, including the construction fees versus uh, sending them to Good Samaritan. Uh, I do want to um, step a, take a step back um, and, and say I, I am not the expert in child and adolescent. Uh, I don't like talking about things that I'm not kind of well versed in. Uh, I'm going to defer to the experts on this call and in the community and, and uh, the other facilities and Dr. Muller, who's uh, brilliant. Um, I'll defer to them about the child and adolescent piece, but at least the adult piece of it, uh, the difference is about $100 whether uh, the patient gets sent to Good Sam versus they get sent to uh, a pup. Uh, and in my head, again, I'm, <clears throat> I do have some economic background, but not I'm not a math whiz, but if you take $30 million and you divide it by $100 a day in savings, uh, I don't think any of us will be alive by the time that loan gets repaid. So um, yeah, I, it doesn't really make financial sense, especially when people in the community are willing to, to step in uh, and take care of it and uh, can do it faster, uh, can provide a higher level of care uh, in a very cost-effective manner. Um, so I, I just want to also reiterate the data. Uh, again, I try to be as data-driven as I possibly can. The data didn't really support the financials. Uh, going back to the data that was presented on the need, uh, the needs assessment was essentially done at, a long time ago. Uh, it goes to show how nice and quick things can be, but it was 2017. Uh, and the needs assessment showed that there was an additional need for 16 beds uh, in 2017, hence why the adult section of the puff is to be well, is going to have 16 beds. Uh, the data that was shared was from 17 to 18, and then 18 to 19. Uh, in 2019, Good Sam expanded their beds by 14 beds. So in 2017, there was a need for 16 beds. In 2019, Good Sam expanded by 14 beds. So that leaves a delta of two, two beds, which the math works out because if you look at the number of patients that have been waiting in the Mary Kay Shell or Peck, or there's a lot of different names for it, but uh, if you look at, again, the data that was presented by the county, uh, I think the number 438 or something uh, gets thrown around because it sounds like a really big number, but it's actually not. Uh, because if you divide 438 in a year by 365 days in a year, you get about one or two uh, patients. So if the needs assessment said 16, we brought 14 beds online in 2019, that makes sense because that means their needs assessment in 2017 was spot on. Uh, so that's, I got to commend them for that. Uh, but they didn't compensate for the fact that there's been additional 14 beds that have been added, uh, which means that's why you're getting that delta of two, which now, again, we've offered. It didn't cost the county any extra money in 2019 when we brought those beds on, and we already told them that it's not going to cost the county any extra money if you need to bring on another 14. Uh, and I think a comment was made that the costs will go up. Uh, no, actually, it's economies of scale. Uh, so costs actually go down when you go up in volume because uh, you don't have to keep duplicating things that uh, are unnecessary. So costs actually go down when you use economies of scale. Um, so it's actually more financially prudent to do that. Um, it's, it, the other issue, and I just I want to emphasize this issue, which I think is the most damaging, is uh, the overestimation of this needs assessment um, is, is going to be dangerous to the rest of the community because it, this puff isn't actually adding additional features to the county. It's duplicating the services that are already available. Um, and uh, at least that's not what we need. <laughs> we need new ideas. We need new facilities that provide a different level of care, a different type of care, not the duplicating of services. And what will end up happening is you're going to save that $100 on this side, uh, but 
destroy uh, the other side of the equation for the current local providers who will then have to either shut down uh, because they can't sustain their census because obviously it will be in the county's best interest to send to patients uh, and, and clients to their own facility first. Uh, but then at the same time, uh, it throws off the acuity balance because that will only leave the sickest, most severe, most uh, disruptive, most medically ill, most patients um, in the uh, left to be able to take care of. And that's not how any of the community works. That's not how the system works. The system works with a balance. There's a balance at every hospital of very, very sick patients and very uh, calm kind of more uh, less acute patients. And the cost to the taxpayer is an average of those two balances, the very, very sick patients along with the not so sick patients. Now, if you pull away the not so sick patients that are typically what go to a puff because they aren't very medically capable, they aren't used, uh, they're not designed typically um, to take care of the most acutely uh, addicted patients and the most uh, violently severe patients, uh, then you're pulling those patients away from the rest of the community, and that throws off the balance. Uh, so that leads the community providers to either decide, is it still worth it because everybody just keeps getting beat up every day and nobody, none of the nurses want to work here, and the costs are astronomical to take care of these patients. Dr. Baga? So do we shut down? Yeah. Yes, sir. Can, can, Sorry. Can, am, I, am I ranting in, lady? Uh, yeah, we're well, well over the time. Can we get you to bring your comments oh, to I'm a close? <laughs> no problem. Absolutely. Absolutely. I will close just with this. You guys have heard this story a thousand times to me. Uh, I think we're duplicating services. The financial piece of it doesn't make sense. And we're not really looking at the trickle-down effect that it's going to have uh, on the rest of the community. Uh, so I, I just have grave concerns about this. Um, again, I can only speak to the adult portion. I can't speak to the child portion. And I, I apologize for taking up so much of your time. But uh, hopefully you can reconsider uh, approving this. And whether it's a continuance or, or a denial, I think, uh, I think we'd be happy to, to step up meet any need that's there uh, while providing the care that's exceptional. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Minty Dillon. Minty Dillon, if you would unmute your phone by pressing star six, you may address the board. Hi, good morning, um, Board of Supervisors. This is Minty Dillon. I work with the uh, Good Samaritan Hospital. I won't uh, take the full two minutes. I believe Dr. Baga addressed all of our concerns expressed here uh, about the proposed PUF, particularly the adult PUF that's the space we're in. I will just reiterate a couple of points that Dr. Baga mentioned, which is that in 2017, the need assessment was done. In 2019, we added 14 beds. Um, and at uh, the board's direction last uh, year, last fall, we met with uh, the county behavioral health department and proposed a full extensive plan to add uh, lots of additional beds. And where we settled is that number 14 makes sense for us without doing major construction. In a very short time frame, we can add 14 additional beds. Uh, we have already drawn the plans out for that. They're in the process of being submitted to OSHPED, uh, and we're hope, hopeful that by the end of this year, we will have additional uh, 14 beds added. Uh, this approval of the adult puff will have a significant impact financially on Good Samaritan Hospital, and for those reasons, we ask uh, the board to not approve uh, the adult puff. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amy Merch. Amy Merch, if you would unmute your phone by pressing star six, you may address the board. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Amy Merch. I apologize for not understanding how to engage on this platform. <laughs> And that was my voicemail from earlier where I spoke about the population and the number of schizophrenics that we have in town. Um, I wanted to piggyback on some other comments made here, um, specifically by Dr. Mola um, and the need for child psychiatric beds and also the probation officer that spoke. Um, I personally had a child 
that went into a juvenile facility because there was not a mental placement for her. Um, they said that she would receive that service in jail, and she did not. And she is an adult now, and she has still not received those services because she did not get them at that time. So when Dr. Mala said care delayed is care denied, um, it, it could be permanent. And that costs our county a lot of money, whether in homeless services, emergency services, crime prevention, probation services. Um, and not only that, I, I also want to speak specifically to the fact that, you know, right now there are children in Kern County and Bakersfield specifically that are experiencing the initial effects of a psychotic event. Um, and the parents and their loved ones, they, the facilities are not available to them. And I, I don't want to speak ill of people that are working in the community to try to solve that. Um, I think we should have as many partnerships as possible. But the data does show that we need to get services to those people within the first six months. Um, it could be a lifetime. It could be decades until we have the opportunity to really engage with those people and them not have gone into such a deep psychosis that it, for example, um, shows physical brain damage that shows up on an MRI. You know, some of the effects are for a lifetime and, and can't be undone. And we need to get to those people as soon as possible. We need those beds open. The idea of a psychotic child sitting in Mary Kay shell for 23 hours waiting for a bed is terrifying. That, that may be our one lost opportunity to reach that child. Um, so I think that it is very important that we have a dedicated facility for adolescents um, and that we try to save money by those people never needing services in the future. Um, and I think that there was a lot of data thrown out here. I don't know how much I can, more I can add to that except to say that as a parent who has gone through multiple levels of this, um, you know, I've also visited my child in the juvenile center, and there are some very, very severely mentally ill children in there, and they don't have anywhere to go. <laughs> and because they are receiving all of the services they possibly can in that facility, there are other children in there that are also, but maybe not quite as mentally ill as that person, that are not receiving services. Um, so this is a compounding issue, and I think that we need to solve it by not only working within, you know, the facilities and partnerships that we already have available, but also with increased facilities. And thank you so much. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker is Joseph Doty. Joseph Doty, if you would unmute your phone by pressing star six, you may address the board. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Good afternoon, Chairman and Board. I do appreciate the time to be able to address you today. Thank you for your time. So my concern, and I represent TAG, Taxpayer Action Group. I don't have any say in any of these organizations or do I represent any of these organizations, but I am strictly concerned about the cost. The cost from a taxpayer standpoint for 32 beds is staggering, $796,250 each just for the initial cost. And that's based on a study that's really old. So if anybody's built anything, and I am a general contractor lately, the cost of materials is up 40 to 60%. You can't get anything done there lately. Subcontractors are so busy and being that this is a public entity construction project, um, I do prevailing wage projects all the time. I'm doing one right now. And the cost is 40 to 60% higher than a private entity building the same structure. But more importantly, this is just not necessary. We have private entities that have available facilities that have offered to expand time and time again at no cost to taxpayers. That cannot be dismissed. 
why wouldn't the county want to save the money? This is a gross expansion of county services and county facilities, and it's just not needed. From a taxpayer standpoint, this makes no financial sense whatsoever. It's not something that anybody can in their right mind say, hey, this is a good deal for taxpayers, because it's just not. What about the operational costs? Has anybody put out a study, a feasibility study about what are the yearly operating costs for these facilities? I believe me, I don't want to dismiss the need for mental health. We see it every day and I don't dismiss this at all. But I just think from taxpayer standpoint, this is not a good return on investment. You know, current facilities have offered to expand at zero cost. And we've just heard from Dr. Baggy that they have expanded. Were those beds included in the feasibility study? You know, it really reinforces the argument that I have that we should reassess. There's no way that in, in good conscience you can just say, yes, this is a good deal based on the information that's being presented today. So Taxpayer Action Group advises that we at least reassess. Again, I don't represent any of these organizations and I have no stake whatsoever. In it. But from taxpayer standpoint, this is not a good deal. So in conclusion, I just think that the board should either reassess or deny this request and work to, directly with existing facilities and networks to expand at no cost to taxpayers. And that would be a good deal for us. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Charles Sears. Charles Sears, if you would unmute your phone by pressing star six, you may address the board. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yep. Awesome, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and the board. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I was asked to come speak today about my objection to the county taking on this project um, as a public project. Uh, listening to all the speakers today, I heard a lot of emotional appeal and catchy phrases from the county representatives, uh, but I also heard a lot of arrogance uh, from the county representatives as to uh, what they think a private entity would have to charge and how they would operate uh, from their internal expenses. So I definitely wanted to point that out that even as the head of a government agency, um, it seems a bit arrogant for them to assume that they would know how, how a private business operated. And I wanted to point that out. So I worked in law enforcement uh, here locally for about five years. I worked in the downtown jail and uh, while working there, I definitely noticed the need for facilities that are being talked about today. Uh, we had homeless, uh, drug addicts, people with mental health issues coming through the jail constantly in and out. So I don't think there's any argument as to the need for the project, um, but there are a few points I think that we should consider as taxpaying citizens. Um, and so I'll just list them out here. I have them written down. Uh, first is public accountability. Historically speaking, government agencies don't have a great track record when, uh, with managing psychiatric, uh, psychiatric hospitals. I don't believe contracted positions would solve this problem as contracted personnel <clears throat> are simply acting as agents of the government, still required to abide by county communication policies. When considering accountability, I believe the better solution would be uh, privately, uh, private ownership with some government oversight. Second, it's not a complete solution. This is being sold as a solution to the homeless mental health issue, but the number of beds being made available is insignificant compared to the actual problem. When I worked the downtown jail, we saw three times that number of people cycle through um, each night that had these specific issues. So 12, uh, or sorry, 16 adult beds is really the tip of the iceberg here. I don't, I don't see it as a complete solution. Um, our community likely won't see a noticeable difference in the homeless population despite what's been said. Uh, taking 16 people off the street is just not, that's not gonna be noticeable um, in my opinion. And so I don't believe that's an honest selling point. The third is inevitable tax increases. Government institutions have the ability to request and receive reallocated funds. Um, they also have little incentive to properly manage funds because of that. Budget increases uh, requests are inevitable and there will be a push for additional tax dollars. If this is approved, 
I believe local taxpayers will eventually be on the hook for covering those increased expenses. If anything, I feel like government should be generally supplementing, not competing with private industry. The opportunity should first be provided to our local hospitals. Even if they miss the RFP, if multiple private entities with a proven track record have now stepped forward, they should be provided the right of first refusal to provide these services. I think every taxpayer listening should ask these questions. What are the standards for success in this project? What is the time period provided that we will judge these standards? What happens in the event of failure by current BHRS? And will the county build in the opportunity for private institutions to take over in, ca in a case of failure similar to current medical? I'd like the, uh, my request would be to ask the board to reopen the RFP process for those private entities to bid appropriately on this project. And that's all. Thank you. Our last speaker is Hannah Attar. Hannah Attar, if you would unmute your phone by pressing star six, you may address the board. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to provide comments today. Uh, I'll try to keep mine brief as I know I'm the last speaker or the last commenter here uh, and not duplicate anything that was previously stated. My name is Hannah Attar with Bakersfield Behavioral. As Jeff had mentioned, um, and I think uh, Dr. Baga as well, uh, we are part of the, the private sector uh, available for psychiatric beds in Kern County and in Bakersfield. I think there's a little bit of an acuity delta on the, the, the psychiatric health facilities and what, um, what patients would qualify for admission for, for a long-term stay, whether their, their acuity at the outset will be uh, of a high acuity or if it's gonna be of a low acuity, we're still, as, as recent as yesterday, kind of having those discussions with the county. And I think from, from that perspective, uh, we're, not, we're not here to say that we have any issues with patient choice or that an addi additional beds or additional facilities is not in the interest of mental health. Of course, we're advocates of mental health. Uh, we are here just to say that there are existing beds in the market that are available. And I know it's been said, but uh, we have additional 20 beds for child and adolescent psychiatric services on an acute inpatient basis. And that's more than three days. Our average length of stay uh, is certainly more than three days. And I think that from our perspective, we just wanna, we just wanna vocalize the, the response that uh, while a lot was said today about certain private institutions, um, focusing only on this puff proposal, I think what's important to note is that um, that the private sector is available to step in, not after construction has been completed, not after um, plans have been reviewed and approved, not after uh, beds can come online. We're able to, with 20 beds, uh, bring on staff and physicians to bring those services available now. Uh, after we've had our renegotiation with the county, uh, with BHRS in terms of this upcoming year, uh, we certainly feel that things have improved. We certainly feel that um, we're able to, to bring those beds online. And with those beds, along with the beds that have been referenced by Good Sam, um, we feel that the need that is being referenced is available. We also don't see the same uh, delay or lag that has been referenced um, by BHRS today in terms of, of patients that have been waiting an inordinate amount of time in order to get into an inpatient facility. Um, we're certainly here to help if there's any, any additional collaboration that we can provide. I, I think we need to continue to work on that with BHRS. At this point, we do find out more of the issues that the county is facing through these Board of Supervisors meetings than we do in outreach. And so to the extent that we can improve that, we would like a seat at the table to help in that regard. Um, one of the things that was mentioned from Director Kuhara was, was, was that the expansion of the private sector yields increases to the county. And I just wanna say that we've never passed our capital improvements. I'm not aware of any private sector provider that passes on their capital improvement costs to their payers um, or onto our vendors. Our, our payer rates and any private sector payer rate is driven directly by the direct care costs. And there are some differences of opinion that we have had along with BHRS with respect to some of those direct care costs that can be impacted. Um, and we're coming from the perspective of what the industry standard nationwide is. So I think from, from our perspective, I think ongoing communication would definitely benefit this issue. 
Um, but I want to make the note that any capital improvement that we would provide, and I don't want to speak for any other private sector providers, but I believe any other private, uh, any other capital improvement that they may provide is not going to be a dollar for dollar by any means pass on to the county and certainly um, not a pass on to the county at all. Um, and then to the extent that um, there are, these services are available now, our collaboration with Good Samaritan in terms of being able to bring on child and adolescent psychiatric beds, those child and adolescent beds are billable for Medi-Cal from uh, Bakersfield Behavioral, which is the IMD that was referenced. Uh, the the Good, Good Samaritan is able to take on the adult patients. So in collaboration with the private sector, we can provide a solution to the problem as it's been referenced. Um, and so I, I just want to I want to stress that we're not coming from a restriction of patient choice. We're not coming from the position that um, that less mental health beds is better. We're coming from the position that let's let's give us a chance to try to solve this problem that's being proposed to the board, and let's see if we can solve it through the private sector collaboration. And if we can't, then then let's let's come to that conclusion collectively as a team. And I think that. Um, uh, what we'll be able to do is at least come more informed with both the cost impact. I know there are many demands on realignment funds, as well as uh, the delay in getting these services online. So I'll conclude there. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This concludes public comment on this item. Thank you. Uh, Director Kuhara, just real quick, I heard several people mention that uh, putting patients at some of these other private facilities would be at no cost to the taxpayer. So I think there's a lack of understanding out there about how that process works. So would you just explain for the public's benefit how the bed day rates work and kind of a little bit about the insurance preference? Yes, Chairman Peters, thank you for letting me have the opportunity to address that. Um, I'd like to start out by saying that your board delayed this in November and asked us to work with both private entities to, to develop a plan to address exactly um, th this problem, increasing their beds at a lower cost. I have been in this position for four and a half months and I have been meeting with them and have made myself available to meet with them at every request. Neither entity has given me a concrete plan that includes a fiscal plan that will demonstrate their ability to create more beds at lower cost. Both have said they can increase their available beds now or within 60 to 90 days. I've asked them to do that. We've asked them to do that before this presentation um, throughout the years. Uh, Good Sam is working to uh, remodel their facility. They submitted an email telling us how many beds they could add on and a design of the facility to demonstrate that. I've never received a plan from BBHH. We are not, uh, one of the statements that was made was that this would result in tax increases for our taxpayers. I'd like to emphasize Kern BHRS is not a general fund department. We, we do not draw on county general funds. So this is um, the best model that we have developed in coordination with our county administrative office. Um, you asked specifically about the bed day rates. Building a puff will allow a lower bed day rate that allows us to also bill Medi-Cal for 50% of the cost. Um, Dr. Baga spoke about the acuity of inpatient individuals. That is a reality we deal with right now in all of our facilities. Um, those individuals, you do have more acute individuals who drive up your cost and less acute individuals who balance that out. That's something happening at all of our facilities now in how they operate. Um, there were comments made about private sector versus public uh, entity. We, we want to own the building. We want to build this facility and own the building and are, are not seeking to take away business from the private sector. This is going to be an operation run through a private entity that we chose through the RFP process. Chairman Peters, did I answer all of your questions or was there anything else that I missed that I, you'd I like me to speak to? I think that answered most of them, but uh, the, the one caller, I think it was Mr. Uh, Doty had mentioned 
you know, we're making assumptions on what the rates for these facilities are going to be. So would you just kind of go into Certainly. detail about how we know what those rates are going to be for different facilities or maybe how the IMD Absolutely. exclusion works? We've, we've contracted the rates with all of our facilities for this upcoming fiscal year. Um, the rates for our two general acute hospitals have been agreed on. Um, they're generally based on their costs, and that's a negotiated rate. Uh, the rate for the IMD, our current IMD provider, BBHH, did negotiate two rates for us this year, one for adults and one for minors, recognizing that for minors we can bill Medi-Cal, but for adults age 22 to 64 we cannot. Um, the, the PUF, we have an existing PUF right now operating uh, run by Crestwood. Um, their rate is a negotiated rate also. All of these are, are negotiated with us on an annual basis, generally based on their cost allocation. Great, thank you. And uh, one more question. I believe you touched on this in the presentation, but uh, if we build this facility and we're looking at how private facilities will be impacted, do, do we expect that, you know, I mean, I, from my understanding, the supply of beds we're gonna have after building this facility is just gonna barely keep up with the demand we have for beds. It's not like we're, we're building out all these new beds that are gonna sit vacant. Is that accurate? Correct, correct. Okay. Thank you, Super uh, Chairman Peters. There were statements made by both Good Sam and BBHH that they're not seeing the current need um, for our community and these beds. You've also heard statements from our community members who've experienced when they've needed to go inpatient and they're not able to access beds. Um, we operate the Psychiatric Evaluation Center at Mary Kay Shell. Um, we're, we're managing those individuals who come into that facility when they're in a mental health crisis. And we know from our data there, because they're the entity that, that places the majority of individuals who need inpatient beds inpatient. Um, I think Dr. Mola said it exceptionally well. Our, our community is growing. Um, we know that the activities we're currently engaged in are going to continue to have an impact on inpatient beds. Um, all, what we're, I think it was the one of the second to last caller um, identified and said something. Let me just pull this up. Um, you know, he really identified that adding 16 beds, really we're adding 32, is insignificant of the need. And I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I, I do hope that BBHH and Good Sam are also able to increase their bed capacity and we continue to need these two facilities and the additional beds they'll provide. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Scribner. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's, there's two things to consider here. Well, I mean, there's quite a bit to consider, but I think two basic categories. One is the patient care and the other is the cost. On the patient care side, Having a situation where, um, where, where people, adults and children are waiting 23 hours, um, going past the 23 hour wait period to, to find a bed, that's unacceptable. I also think it's unacceptable for us to be in a position where we have to send minors out of county to put that hardship on their parents, their families to have to deal with that. I couldn't imagine you know, having one of my kids in a neighboring county um, and then having to deal with the logistics of all that when the situation is horrible enough as it is. And so that's something that we have to rectify, I believe, um, through the action that we take today. Um, and so on, on that side, we, we definitely need to deal with the fact that there are not enough beds in this community for inpatient. Um, our, our relationships with the private sector in this county for different services that we provide, I think are very important to everybody on this board. Um, we do it with, with everything from uh, mental health to, to trash service. Um, there's a litany of things that we utilize the private sector. And I think that when you, can, you have a situation where the private sector can fulfill your need at a cost that's, that's at or below what we could provide it for ourselves through, um, through government employees and government services, then we should go that route. But what I see in this situation is that's not the case. The costs are higher if we're going through the private sector providers than if we did it for ourselves, particularly when you're looking at, the, at juveniles. Um, I think that that is a no-brainer. The situation with BBHH 
because of the fact that we can't bill Medi-Cal for those kids that go in for service there, and it's all, um, it's all paid for through our realignment funds, which are funds that we need for other types of services. That, to me, shows that that's not a good alternative for us um, when it comes to adults. With juveniles, yes, you can bill Medi-Cal, but with adults, you can't. And so, um, so we have a, am I correct on that? So we, so we have a, a, a situation there. And so clearly, um, we, need, we need to address that fact. Um, this has been over five months ago that this came to the board, and I agreed to, to, do a, to um, vote for a continuance because I wanted, as you said, for our private sector partners to have an opportunity to show us a concrete plan in how they could provide for this need at a cost that was at or below what we could provide um, for if we go this route in, in building these, these puffs. And unfortunately, I don't see, I haven't seen that materialize. I haven't seen them present that. And so um, I want to drill down a little bit more on the conversations you've had with Good Sam recently. Um, if they're talking about being able to expand and add beds, but there's a difference, I think, between having a, an actual bed and having the staffing that is on duty to be able to handle if we call and say, hey, we have someone that needs to go in the facility. And so can you just, just speak a little bit more to those conversations you had with them? And then also speak to the fact that the demand is rising. And so this doesn't mean that we're not going to continue to utilize these, these partnerships that we have. It's just um, a need that we have to expand capacity um, while still utilizing these, these other providers um, when it's appropriate and when we, when we need their help. Supervisor Scrivener, through the chair, that is correct. We do absolutely plan to continue to utilize our contracted providers at BBHH and Good Sam for their services. Um, I, I have been meeting extensively with Good Sam. Um, the, the point that you bring up about beds versus staffing really, um, I think, was a point made in the last meeting in November also by BBHH. It, at times, the BBHH is a very large facility and they absolutely potentially have the physical ability um, to open up and have more beds, but if they do not have the doctors, nurses, and required staffing to, um, to fill those beds, then that's been an issue. Um, so for Good Sam, they are proposing to remodel their existing facility to create more inpatient beds. Um, there, there's a level of staffing that they will have to address once those beds are available. And it is my assumption that they have the, the ability to add that staff to be able to operate those beds. I think it was either 14 beds that they're adding, the additional 14 beds when they come online. Um, they were given the green light by myself directly um, when I, I took this position. And that was back in January. They said um, in their earlier statement it would take them 60 to 90 days. And so we, are, we continue to wait for, for those beds to become available. How, how, do the, how do the costs compare if, we, if we're utilizing Good Sam's bed space versus if we move forward with this? Um, and that's including the, yes. the financing on construction, et cetera. Sure, thank you. Um, Good Sam is a general acute hospital. So like I said earlier, that is one of the facilities that tends to have a higher bed day rate because of the type of facility it is and the individuals that they serve there. So adding on um, expansion costs, um, potentially increase their overall cost, which if that drives up a bed day rate, I'm paying an, a higher increase bed day rate for any of these facilities indefinitely. A puff is the type of facility that offers inpatient services for individuals who don't have those comorbid cool medical needs. They can, they can take individuals who are just as acute. They just don't have the comorbid medical needs that require a general acute care hospital. 
but because of the model and how they're licensed, they can operate at a much lower cost. So I have a lower overall bed day rate that I can utilize at a puff, and I'm billing Medi-Cal for 50%. So when, if I were to give this to a private entity to build out, if it drives up their bed day rate, I'm paying that bed day rate indefinitely over time. Uh, it's, it's ongoing, whereas the financing plan that we're proposing now um, through a bond will be paid off. Um, I've been told by the CAO's office that it's expected our annual repayment cost for this facility will be $1.8 million a year. When I showed my graph earlier about the 16-bed model for utilization, just by what I can build Medi-Cal alone, I anticipate to save $2.8 million a year just in our realignment costs, but by being able to bill directly to Medi-Cal. Thank you for that answer, and I, I'm going to ask the CAO, I think, a, a question in a minute, but um, back to the patient care issue, that did I, did I read correctly that there were nearly 500, um, 500 patients that had to wait past the 23-hour hold period last year, yes. and the expectation is that that is going to increase this year. Absolutely. Is that right? Yes. Now, how many of those, how many of those were minors? I don't have that information broken up directly for me right now, but I believe it was probably around half. Around of half. The that's that's story. what I had had surmised from from what um, we had talked about before. So so those are you know those are our children, roughly 250 some odd kids that are are waiting all that time in order to find bed space. And I you know to me that you know that's as important as as the costs are to consider. Is is the you know the the level of care that we're able to provide to patients, and that you know that's something that you know we can help address with this, but also these uh, you know these private sector partners that we have, they can also help us you know to uh, you know to deal with the increase in in uh, in patients that we are anticipating seeing, and so I don't see this as something where you know we're taking business away. I see this as we are are being part of the solution to anticipate the increasing need that we're having. And so, you know, this, I think that, unfortunately, there's going to be, you know, plenty of patients to go around in the community. And that's, that's an unfortunate thing, but we have to, we, I think that we have to, um, you know, we have to move um, to address that reality um, that, we're, that we're going to see. And I just wanna make one comment. One of the callers was concerned about, you know, this is gonna lead to raising taxes. You don't receive any general fund money. The only way that the county could raise taxes is if we went out for a sales tax or something, and that would be general fund. And so this would have nothing to do with um, any any effort that the county would ever ever partake as far as um, increasing a sales tax or, or whatever else. Your your funding um, doesn't come from our general fund, Mr. Alsop. Your staff has analyzed this proposal, correct? Yes, sir. Okay, do you have any comments on, on the efficacy of, of us moving forward on this? I think there's a need. I think that Ms. Kuhara uh, has laid out a, a detailed, uh, compelling plan. Um, clearly a need. I agree with you that this, uh, if Good Samaritan wants to build uh, capacity, we encourage them to do so. If BBHH wants to build capacity, I think we encourage them to do so. Uh, but my office and all of my leadership team uh, is in full support of behavioral health on this item. And uh, I know Ms. Martinez is here who could talk about some of the details of the financing if, uh, if your board would like. Well, Ms. Martinez, if, if, if there's something that, I, you know, I'd, I'd look to the board, but I, you know, I'm, I'm satisfied with, you know, with the plan that's been laid out. And, you know, I, I think that the reasons for it are compelling. I understand. Um, that our, our partners with Good Sam and BBHH have, have concern about this. They have, a biz, you know, they have a business to run as well. And I, I just, I really, I, I really don't think that they should look at this as being a, a threat to, to their financial position. I, I think that because of the increasing need that this is, this is going to be um, just one more, one more resource that we have to deal with um, this vulnerable population. 
And so I think it's it's prudent for us to move forward. And um, I'll, you know, of course, um, look. I of course look forward to hearing from my colleagues. But I'd be prepared to make a motion at at any time. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Scrivener. Any other supervisors like to make comment? Supervisor Perez. Uh, thank you. I think uh, Supervisor Scrivener, that was a masterful presentation of the issues. Uh, so I won't add to that uh, except to say that I appreciate all the work that's been done. I appreciate Good Sam and our partners in the community who have been doing this a long time in circumstances where it wasn't a politically uh, popular uh, to do so. Uh, they have done that, and I'm so grateful for that. And I agree that uh, as we do this more and we get a proper count and we actually engage the community where they are, we're going to find that we have a need more than we could have imagined. So all of these pieces uh, tie into that larger network. And again, thank you. I'm excited. I feel very hopeful about these plans that I want to be uh, uh, very supportive and a partner to you. So uh, Zach, if you wanted to make that motion, I, I certainly feel ready to proceed. So moved on staff's recommendation. Second. Okay, thank you. Are there uh, any other comments before yeah. we cast our votes? Uh, Supervisor Couch. <clears throat> I want to thank the staff for their their five months of work. I also want to thank our providers for their input. Um, yeah, it is. Can you not hear me? Okay. Um, in fact, we had a meeting, a Zoom meeting uh, yesterday, and uh, I just I want to speak to something that I that I sensed throughout the whole meeting, and that, and that I'm going to ask our staff to work on, but I'm also going to ask our providers to work on. I got the real sense that there is a huge lack of trust between the department and the providers. And I don't know why that is, um, but I certainly sensed it. Um, people didn't just outright didn't believe some, some things that you were telling them. One thing that, that came up and I thought I, I, I do want to address is that there was a, and this is rational, um, fear, I guess, when you would hear about this, that uh, part of the impetus for, for you even looking at this was the utilization of uh, realignment funds and how you could save on some realignment funds. So what I, I think the numbers you just sort of walked us through, it sounds like you're going to have about a million dollars extra because of the utilization of Medicare to pay some half the bills. Um, so there shouldn't be less realignment funds in the pool. There should be more available. Do you, do you agree with that, or do I have that? Yes, Supervisor Couch through the chair, I do. And about a million dollars more just from what you have described, the, the way you're, the financing Correct. would work. Um, also, that what came up yesterday, which I, I want to, it wasn't mentioned today, but it came up yesterday, was that this will take a long time for you to go through to get your plans approved by through the OSHPOD, which we are not subject to. Correct. Correct? The, a puff, a puff is, is not, not subject, subject to, to OSHPOD regulations. <clears throat> okay. Um, one question about just the process here. If, if we move forward on this today, are you bringing back to us a look at the financing plan, which you are still working up? Are, is there anything you're coming back to us with? Supervisor Couch of the chair, I'm going to have Ms. Martinez answer okay. that question. She's handling finance. Thank you. Supervisor Couch of the chair, Elsa Martinez, um, CAO office. Uh, yes, what we will do is you will be authorizing the release of the um, request for qualification and the RFP. We'll have a timeline when financing is needed, so we'll be back to your board with uh, the final financing plan. We already did a preliminary one just to make sure that A, it's affordable, what are the options that the county has, but then we'll, be, we'll bring back for your board final approval of that financing with very detailed and specifics on the interest rate, on the ter uh, payment terms and all that information. Okay, thank you for that. What, the reason for me asking that question is simply this. If there are providers in the community that can still, at this point, come forward with a concrete plan that can compete with what the director and the department have come up with, I am all ears. But I have heard, I haven't actually seen or heard um, 
specifics on that exact plan. So to, pa to put a pause on what your work is right now on sort of the possibility that that could be done, um, I can't do, unfortunately. I need, I need to support you moving at least, moving forward in this. But at the same time, I'm, all, I'm, I'm wide open to, to the private sector coming forward and solving um, the need that's been expressed uh, and being at least competitive with what's been, what's been proposed. Um, one thing I do have a, f a fear of is that, uh, and everybody needs to recognize this, we are gonna save some realignment dollars with this move, but realignment dollars comes from sales tax, correct? <clears throat> I think this is another example of how, uh, and I don't talk about this very much, but the governor's proposal to ban fracking and to phase out oil production altogether would have a huge impact on Kern County, obviously, in our sales tax, and that would directly impact realignment funds, obviously, and projects like this. And I think that's another piece that needs to be pointed out to the governor's office of, of the impacts of that decision on Kern County, or potentially on Kern County. <clears throat> um, thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Couch. Supervisor Maggard. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Ms. Kuahara, could you draw a line for me uh, that demonstrates the uh, effect of this decision, this move, on your ability to manage mentally ill homeless people? Supervisor Maggard, through the chair, um, as Supervisor Couch just stated, this. Uh, moving forward on this project, we anticipate the facilities won't be completed until around 2023. So it's absolutely essential that um, our current providers, if they are able to expand, do so because we know right now we continue to need those inpatient beds for all of our community and especially as we are outreaching to our homeless population, I, I myself have traveled with the Rome team. I have talked to the individuals on the street. Um, I've assessed them. I was assessing them for their ability to meet 5150 criteria. And it, it, it's just a matter of time. For each of those individuals we are connecting to and talking, it is literally a matter of time and being there at the right circumstances to justify that hold and to get them into treatment. Thank you for that explanation. I'm very appreciative of that. The, there's another issue with regard to insurance. And you know our, the, the government uh, in California provides insurance to a vast, wide array of people. But you mentioned earlier that particularly with regard to uh, the mentally ill and homeless mentally ill, that insurance was not adequate to pay for, for example, in-house treatment and things like that. So should we seek assistance from our state legislators to go to the state and ask them, I mean, if they want to help us affect uh, this issue, do they not need to also help us with uh, make finding insurance reimbursement so we can adequately treat them? Supervisor Maggot, through the chair, most of these individuals that we're treating through homeless outreach are going to be eligible for Medi-Cal. It's just the mechanism of getting them signed up and then getting reimbursement. But the services that we're providing um, when they don't have insurance is something that is a draw on our realignment. I believe there's um, a board letter going forward today about street medicine and the ability to bill Medi-Cal um, pre and post around incarceration. I think there are some plans to expand Medi-Cal coverage for some individuals. Um, that would absolutely be helpful for our department and our efforts, both in the efforts that we're making on the physical health side, because these individuals have a number of physical health issues. Clinica Sierra Vista and Dr. Bear are actively engaging in street outreach and doing amazing things. They need to be able to bill for that and recoup so they can continue those services, as do we. Well, I, I would ask you to help us and me specifically with the, the pertinent points that are necessary so we can make a case to our legislators that they go to work for us to help us solve this issue. Uh, and it, it, that doesn't matter if you're a Republican or a Democrat. These are people, uh, it affects every member of, of Kern County 
and the state of California. So if you could help us with that, I'm sure that we will push that along to our uh, representatives and see if they can help us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. So are there any other comments? Uh, Supervisor Perez. Just quickly, uh, to my colleagues, Supervisor Couch and Maggard, I did not mean to push the motion before you had spoken. I just didn't see you guys plugged in, so no disrespect, but appreciate your remarks. I think this is an excellent discussion. Thank you. All right, well, we do have a motion and a second, so please cast your votes. The motion is approved. All ayes. Great. Thank you. Our next item is number 39 under the Kern County Fire Department, and that is the proposed Kern County Fire Department strategic plan for 2021 through 2026. And I would like to call on our fire chief, uh, David Witt, for a report. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the board. Thank you for this opportunity. It is a minute afternoon. Um, thank you for this opportunity, and I'd like to start with the presentation of the strategic plan for the Kern County Fire Department. I'm excited about this opportunity. In 2008, we had um, been asked to put together a strategic plan, and then followed up with a CPSM report, we were asked to put together a strategic plan. And so I'm very proud of the team members that did this. It's a two-year process. It started uh, just after I made interim fire chief. So I'll start with the thank yous. Thank you to Chief Bowler for oversight, uh, Chief Augusta, who's sitting next to me without him, this wouldn't have taken place and just very instrumental in this process. Uh, he's done a great job and I'm very proud of him. Standards of covers, Chief Wells, uh, the union, Mike Denny, uh, Fleet, Ron Flox, Fox, Georgiana Armstrong from OES, your fire marshal, Derek Tysinger, Emergency Communications Center, Melinda Hunley, uh, EMS, Nick Herndon, uh, operations side, Battalion Chief, Joe Appleton, Captain Keegan Smith, Engineer Corey Wolford and Firefighter Chris Brisky from Cal State University Bakersfield, Dr. Martinez. Students Louise, Mercedes, and Ash Dip. Um, accreditation, accreditation Manager Chief Duncan, Administrative Assistant uh, Ms. Alcade, CAO Representative Jason Wiebe, Accounting Steve Long, PIO Andrew Freeborn, Communications Erica Bain, Information Technology Michael Clark. Uh, logistics, Greg Houston, facilitator advisor, uh, Mr. Krauss, and thank you for all those that were involved, as well as all the stakeholders that participated in this big event. As the fire chief of the Kern County Fire Department, I'm pleased to present the Kern County Fire Department strategic plan for 2021 through 2026. This plan is a collective effort of many contributors within the Kern County Fire Department in conjunction with county leaders to ensure our plan was supportive and reflective of the county's missions and goals. That is 2008 uh, strategic plan and 2017 goals. And I know the CEO's office is currently working on um, another uh, plan. The driving force behind our plan is our strategic planning committee, a group of talented and dedicated members of our organization who are committed to the pursuit of excellence. In completing its work, the committee relied on input collected through surveys of internal and external stakeholders, including members of local government, business, and nonprofit groups. The broad input provided focused affirmation of KSC's, of Kern County Fire Department's organizational mission, vision, and core values that serve as the basis for these strategic initiatives and accompanying goals and objectives of the plan. 
These initiatives will serve as a cornerstone of our planning effort for the next five to seven years. I want to thank everyone who contributed their time and effort in making the document one we can truly be proud of. As a result of the effort, the Kern County Fire Department will continue to be a highly respected fire agency and industry leader. Although the production of the Kern County Fire Department strategic plan represents over two years of sustained effort, it marks the beginning, the beginning of the process. The plan provides us with clear direction, priorities, and focus in continuing to provide excellent service to the communities we serve. Our challenge now is to move forward with the implementation phase of the process, using the plan as a guide to assist in making informed decisions which are necessary during these financially challenging times. Our intent throughout the implementation is to become a more resilient organization that responds to the changing needs of our citizens in an operationally effective and fiscally efficient manner, in an operationally effective and a fiscally efficient manager. The first order of business was to evaluate, create, or adjust, or reaffirm the Kern County Fire Department's guiding documents such as mission, vision statements, core values, mandates, and industrial standards for best practices and performance measures. The committee felt that these to be the foundation of the organization and the result should be determined first, and we did that, went through that, and that is our mission. The Kern County Fire Department is dedicated to protecting life and property by providing effective public education, fire prevention, and emergency response services. We are committed to proudly serve our community in the safest, most professional, and efficient manage manner. Okay. Supporting documentation, I mentioned the 2008 strategic plan of the county and the 17 goals, and a couple of those uh, that I, we wanted to highlight be a model of excellence in managing our business and people, enhancing the quality of life for the Kern County residents. We developed this through questioning um, our internal fire department. We want to be effective operationally and, and fiscally within our department. And so it was important that we, I get internal feedback, how to do better, and externally from our stakeholders, from a broad, wide group, um, that we used in conjunction with Jason Weeby uh, to uh, send out to over 80 different groups. By determining, we developed this by determining core issues and their feedback by establishing positive initiatives. So what were the problems and how we were gonna get there, uh, defining action timeframes, who was responsible and how we would proceed. By assigning the timeframes and delegating authority also to um, various responsible people. By designing a process to ensure follow-up and completion. Okay. And to, so to start, um, you know, across the board, both internally and externally, the fiscal stability of the fire department uh, comes up. <coughs> the Kern County Fire Department is funded through a portion of property taxes assigned to the fire fund. A significant percentage of these funds comes from oil petroleum industry. Due to irregular industry adjustments, local and world markets, the petroleum property tax revenue varies greatly from year to year. This makes it extremely difficult for the fire chief and senior leadership to forecast the budget for infrastructure and customer services. Even with regular county general fund supplemental allocations to the fire department, the struggle has progressed to the point where apparatus and facilities are deteriorating and staffing st struggles, staffing stations, and coming up with ideas to do it uh, Cheaper, the loss of services in some cases. Compounding the solution is a national movement towards renewable energy, making it unwise to count on petroleum property tax as we sustain the source of future revenue. The Kern County Fire Department is committed to assisting the Board of Supervisors in solving this issue through exploring, analyzing, and providing recommendations of all available options with the goal of stabilizing the fire department funding. And so we are going to uh, put together a committee, myself and the, and the CEO's office, a wide variety of people to come up with uh, ways to uh, address revenue shortages within the, the fire department. Um, and I will be responsible for that and I will report back where we are. Um, 
big, long history of fiscal stability with the fire department. I'd like to first say thank you for the $4 million uh, tax transfer from the general fund to the fire fund, as well as the $10 million allocation for one-time funding for fire apparatus and equipment this budget year. And so that's uh, a huge uh, boost to us um, internally. When this was set, though, in 2014, um, we, you know, there's an $18 million transfer. It just wasn't enough, um, the amount of money. At that time, the oil prices were $117 a barrel. Um, today, I think they're around 48. Um, and the reserves were uh, more plentiful then. Um, we're worried about drilling. And so together, um, that's what this is all about, is together, everybody working together to find common solutions to move forward, and that was our number one item, is fiscal stability. Okay, next slide. Okay, call processing time, that's the amount of time that it takes to, for a dispatcher to answer the phone and dispatch equipment. Um, we, we haven't met our objective there, objective industry standards. Uh, we're gonna be aggressively working on that, and uh, we have a plan, and, and we're formulating it through um, a, a lot of people giving suggestions on how to improve this area, and uh, our ECC manager will be uh, making recommendations to me, and I will report back on that. Next slide. Mission and core value-based decision-making. And so you saw the slide before of our values and our mission, and, and we need to, I need to infiltrate that throughout our department. Um, you know, it's there, but it, it starts with me, and I need to follow those and um, lead by example. And uh, we're working on that. We're gonna initiate train the trainer sessions, the concept with all divisions and programs and deliver organization-wide training by, um, with internally. Next slide. Internal communication, arguably the most critical trait of successful organization is effective communication in this age of technology. We can reach infinite numbers of people for an, in an instant, but is it true communication? Do they, they heard what we've said and, and really truly understand? Are we relaying accurate information as received to the intent in which it was sent? Information may be flowing efficiently down through all levels of the organization, but is it flowing just as efficiently back up to all levels? Also, how do we know what the sufficient information without overloading the receiver too much or, or with irrelevant information? What are the most effective methods? What information should be sent electronically? What should be delivered in person? And how we relay that? Um, we're gonna form an intra-organizational working committee to develop uh, communication policy, including but not limited to regular and ongoing informational briefings and reports. Next slide. Um, a need to improve firefighter retention. The Kern County Fire Department continues to uh, lose experienced firefighters. This results in a loss of valuable experience and leadership to the department and a loss of investment dollars belonging to the taxpayers of Kern County. While speculation may be made as to what the reasons are for this ongoing issue, a thorough investigation uh, needs to take place in order to validate the causes. Only then can the Kern County Defi Fire Department develop solutions to be implemented internally where possible and partner with the Kern County Board of Supervisors where needed. Um, together with our, our labor union as well as the CEO's office and myself, look at um, all the options, what, what truly is going on. Next. Community risk reduction, oftentimes we focus on just putting out the fire and really behind the scenes, if we can stop it there, that's what we're after. The American Fire Service has historically been response orientated, resulting in the vast majority of available funds being allocated to fire suppression divisions. It has been proven, however, that it's more cost effective to prevent these fires from occurring. And so we want to implement community um, risk reduction, and we're developing a plan on how to do that with our current staff. Excellent. Data in a world um, filled with data and the need to make data-based decisions more than ever 
with as much as we're analyzing the fire department. We need to improve our available data and how we get it and the ease of collection data. Um, we're going to deliver organization-wide training and emphasis on entering and retrieving and analyzing and utilizing data with a goal of the supervisors and officers to become more efficient in evaluating and implementing. And we've got a couple programs that we currently have money for in the budget to implement to help us um, be able to get the best possible data to make quality decisions. Next slide. There's a need to evaluate the suppression platform. The Kern County Fire Department currently operates a traditional fire suppression operational platform, including engine and truck response and static station placement. Over the years, it has served the citizens of Kern County well. However, there is always a danger of being stagnant and missed opportunities when an organization relies on past practices without asking why, asking the questions, why do we do it this way? Is it a healthy practice for all organizations? If there is potentially more effective method of delivering a service, it should be evaluated for the possible implementation. There is no danger of evaluating other ways of delivering service. In fact, the danger lies not evaluating and being content with the status quo. By exploring other configurations, KCFD may discover more efficient ways of delivering service. Under the direction of the chief deputy, they will utilize out outside evaluator to review the Kern County Fire Department emergency service delivery model. This is a common practice um, through standards of cover and delivery of this as compared to other model concepts. And then as identified from external stakeholders, they'd like to see more social media communication and we will be addressing that. Next slide. So what we're asking for today is to receive and file um, the strategic plan and we will be, I will be in contact with you throughout this process of things that we find and um, the action plans and uh, getting ideas and suggestions from your board um, as we move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. I appreciate it. Uh, Madam Clerk, have we received any public comment on this item? No, sir, no public comment. Okay, are there any uh, questions or comments from the board? Supervisor Couch. Chief, thank you for that. I don't want to belabor this, but um, I know we're involved negotiating with all the cities. But yes, sir. Where, where are we with the uh, our own Kern County Airport? With the airport? Yes, sir. So uh, with the contract cities, uh, uh, COO uh, Jim Zerfus and I have been meeting with all of the cities. Um, we're starting to meet with all the cities and, and really uh, communicating well with those uh, as we move across the spectrum and we have until June of 2022. Um, Myself and uh, CAO, uh, Mr. Alsop, have talked about the, as well as Brent Curry, about the need to um, also have some type of an agreement with the county over the airport. It's a common practice. Um, it's about $1.7 million to operate, and my hope would be is that we could come to um, look at this and have an, some type of an agreement by the time we have the contract city um, agreements done in June of 2022, but it just makes sense. It's um, a, a needed, um, you know, service that we provide to the airport and um, it should be done in a way that is similar to the contract cities and that is the, the, uh, the calls inside the area versus the outside area and uh, what we truly provide um, for that opportunity. I know Supervisor Maggard had mentioned this last time I talked and um, we're looking into it and we'll be addressing it as well as the CPSM report. This so, is one of the So is it, a, is it a, do we have a deadline? Do you and Mr. Witzow have a deadline of achieving that at the same time as the contract cities in 2022? That would be my um, recommendation. I need to uh, I would, see I'd, what Mr. Alsop thinks. I, I would agree with that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? 
Okay, I would entertain a motion to receive and file. So moved. Second. Please cast your votes. The motion is approved, all ayes. Thank you. Okay, our next item is number 51 under the probation department, a request to approve the juvenile justice realignment annual plan, including associated allocations. And for that report, I would like to call on uh, probation chief T.R. Maracle. Good afternoon now. I've, I've always learned when you're speaking publicly, the worst place to be is between your audience and a sandwich. So <laughs> it's been a long morning now, afternoon. But I, I do think this item is very important, and I did want to take the time to explain a little bit to the board and, and to the public. So I'm here to ask you to approve our plan for the juvenile justice realignment. I'm going to talk a little bit about SB 823 and its background, and then talk a little bit about our local plan that we're presenting to you today. SB 823 was passed in 2020. What it does is effective July 1st, 2021, it prospectively realigns DJJ commitments. What is DJJ? It's the Division of Juvenile Justice. Most people know it by its former name, the California Youth Authority. So um, this is a state facility for the most serious juvenile offenders who are not tried as adults. It's important to note that um, the youth currently at DJJ already committed will stay there. Uh, they won't be coming back at, at July 1st. However, DJJ will close its doors July 1st of 2023. So there may be a few that do come back to us at that time. Why this is significant is because it's a very different population in custody that the probation department typically deals with. As you know, we run three juvenile facilities, but with this population, we can have youth up to age 25. What's also different is the length of the commitment. The average commitment length for a DJJ uh, commitment is 28 months, so over two years. Locally, when we do a commitment program, it's typically between four and eight months. Uh, we typically have, uh, have 10 to 15 new DJJ commitments per year, so this number will obviously go up as we go forward. With our local plan, the first thing is, like the state often does, it doesn't give us much time to uh, plan and prepare. Um, SB 823 called for a subcommittee of the Juvenile Justice Coordinating Council uh, that was with probation as myself as the chair, the court, the district attorney, the public defender, behavioral uh, health and recovery services, Department of Human Services, and the superintendent of schools. In addition, it called for three, a minimum of three community members. We actually had four community members uh, representing Kern County Network for Children, the Wendell Davis Foundation, CAPK, and All of Us or None. The subcommittee approved this plan on March 10th um, of this year, and the full Juvenile Justice Coordinating Council approved this plan on April 14th. The statute requires that the plan be revisited at least once every three years, but I've already made the commitment to the subcommittee that we'll meet a minimum of one a year, once a year. I think that's much more appropriate, especially in the beginning as we go forward. The specifics of the plan include that the vast majority of these realigned uh, youth will be housed at one of our vacant pods at our Kern Crossroad facility. This pod can hold up to uh, 40 youth, and there's two 20-bed um, units. Typically, at any given time, we have between 30 and 35 youth at uh, DJJ currently, so the capacity is there. While almost all of the youth will be able to be housed there, there is possible that we might have to have some specialized contracts. Uh, this is especially true for females, because we, have, we commit them at such a small number that Typically, we might have just one or zero, so it's hard to have a whole program when you have such a small number. So CPOC and CSAC are both working together on a consortium that will help facilitate po uh, possible contract for certain individuals. Our plan is gonna focus on accountability and opportunity. Uh, the accountability will ensure public safety. First of all, this is a secure setting at the current Crossroad facility. However, in our upcoming budget, we propose significant security upgrades. Um, these youth will be uh, spending a significant amount of time in custody and the program will be based on discipline and order. However, we're also gonna focus on opportunity for these youth. Our, our approach is gonna be uh, evidence-based and we will uh, be trauma-informed. We're going to provide treatments based on the individual needs of these youth. We're gonna have supportive services through mental health, our new RAP units, which are re-entry, ADA, and programming units, as well as our juvenile programming uh, program. Um, we're going to focus on educational and vocational opportunities for these youth. The programs will be named Apex Academy, with Apex standing for Achievement, Perseverance, and Excellence. We want to prepare these youth for a successful reintegration. I'll talk a little bit about the financial and our personnel um, matters with this plan. 
Because it's prospective, the funding from the state rolls out over a three-year period. So in fiscal year 21-22, the county will receive 1.4 million. In fiscal year 22-23, uh, it'll be 4.1 million. And in fiscal year 23-24, it'll be 6.9 million. Uh, the statute calls for a revisitation of the formula after phys uh, fiscal year 23-24. I think it's very important for our county to keep an eye on this. Those of you who were around when uh, AB 109 happened, you know that that formula was changed often and never to the benefit of Kern County. So we'll definitely want to keep an eye on that. In year one, we'll be adding 10 juvenile correction officer series positions. This will allow us to open uh, one of the units at the pod for so at least 20 youth, which should uh, cover uh, the population that will be going in there. Um, I will be back before your board in a couple weeks to ask for those positions now so I can move forward on the recruitment process. However, we'll make sure the timing of the actual hiring um, maximize the effective financial considerations. Over year two and three, we'll expand both our staffing and our services to handle this growing responsibility. In conclusion, I just want to say that there's been many significant changes and reforms in the criminal justice system over the last decade. Most of these are things that we didn't necessarily ask for. However, the probation department is committed to doing all we can to make this uh, Division of Juvenile Justice realignment as successful as possible for both the youth and our community. We will work hand in hand with our county and community partners. I wanna take this opportunity to show my appreciation of the men and women of the probation department. Because of their passion and dedication, they've stepped up no matter what the challenges, and I thank them. We need to understand that all of these youth will be released back into our community. So it's in the best interest of everyone that we do all we can to put these youth in the best position to be successful upon release. I wanna thank the CAO's office and the Board of Supervisors for their support in this endeavor and for all that probation does. I would like to offer a tour to any of the board members or their staff if they would like to see where uh, this new program is gonna be housed. So just if you do, just shoot me an email or give me a call. And um, I'd ask you to approve the plan Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Chief. Uh, Supervisor Perez. Okay, thank you. Uh, TR, that was really excellent, and I, I agree with you. I'm hungry, too, so <laughs> I'll be brief. I'm really excited about a tour and about connecting up, and we've talked about this before, field in particular that has a real niche with serving this population in entry-level positions you know, that are somewhat non-traditional and really well-suited for a population that has not been successfully integrated into the community for whatever reason. And I, I appreciate your acknowledgement that, you know, we've, this is our community and we have to deal with each other in one way or another, whether we like it or not. So this just makes sense. It makes, uh, you know, it is, it's the right thing to do. And I'm excited about the opportunity to put these young people to work, have them see their name on a paycheck you know, that, that is of their merit and of their labor and of the, you know, their trajectory, of course, is limitless when people like you uh, believe in them. So thank you. I'm excited about this. You know, I, I really have a, a, a plan for a, you know, a jobs plan that I'd like to work with you on for these youngsters because if we can get them and redirect them, I think the, uh, you know, sky's the limit. So thank you. I, I look forward to more discussions about that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from the board? You need a motion uh, to approve? Uh, yeah, if there's no more comments, but entertain a motion to approve. So moved. Is there a second? Thank you. All right, thank you. Please cast your votes. And Mr. Chairman, for the record, no public comment on this item. Thank you, I appreciate it. The motion is approved, all eyes. Okay, before we adjourn to closed session, uh, there's a non-agenda item that needs to be considered. Uh, the need to take action on this non-agenda matter occurred after the agenda was posted on April 22nd, 2021. Uh, county officials learned of significant information and such information warrants immediate consider by, consideration by the board. So I would request a motion to consider closed session item number 78, conference with legal counsel anticipated litigation. Is there a motion to add that to the agenda? So moved. Second. Please cast your votes. The motion is approved, all ayes. Great, well, having no more items to consider in open session, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn to closed session to consider county administrative office item number 76 and county council items 77 and 78. Thank you, without objection, we are adjourned in honor of Gerald Haslam. Mm -hmm.